In December 1918, on the very day that a British cavalry division, flags flying and bands playing, marched into Cologne as the conquerors of a beaten nation, the manager of the Hotel National in Bern received a letter. Having read it twice, he summoned his secretary. Have we ever had staying in the hotel a man called Le Comte de Guy? She thought for a moment. Not as far as I can remember. The manager handed her the letter and waited in silence until she'd read it. It seems a peculiar request from an unknown man, he remarked as she laid it down. A dinner for four, no expense to be spared, a private room at half past seven sharp, guests to ask for room X. He tapped his teeth with his pen thoughtfully. I wish I could think who this Comte de Guy is. Would you send me the maître d'hôtel to me at once? The head waiter, as he left the office after receiving his instructions, did not share the manager's misgivings. He was a man who loved his work, and a free hand over preparing a dinner was a joy in itself. At twenty-five past, the first guest arrived. He spoke with a German accent. I wish to be taken to room X. The French secretary stiffened involuntarily. A Bosch she murmured to the manager, as the first arrival disappeared through the swing doors at the end of the lounge. Almost immediately afterwards, the second and third members of the party arrived. They did not come together and were evidently strangers to one another. The leading one was a tall, gaunt man, with a ragged beard and a pair of piercing eyes. As he asked for room X, the little fat man standing just behind him started and shot him a bird-like glance. Then he too asked for room X. He's not French, said the secretary, as the ill-assorted pair were led out of the lounge by the head waiter. That last one was another Bosch. The manager thoughtfully twirled his pince-nez between his fingers. Two Germans and an American. As he spoke, the door again swung open, and a man wearing a soft hat and a thick white scarf, pulled up as almost completely to cover his face, came in. All that the manager could swear to was a pair of deep-set, steel-grey eyes which seemed to bore through him. You got my letter this morning? Monsieur le Comte de Guy, the manager bowed. Everything is ready, and your three guests have arrived. Good. I will go to the room at once. The maître d'hôtel stepped forward. As the Count passed through the swing doors, he turned to the head waiter. After the coffee has been brought in, I do not wish to be disturbed under any circumstances whatever. Mais certainement, Monsieur le Comte, I personally will see to it. He flung open the door. It cannot be said that the atmosphere of the room was congenial. The three occupants were regarding one another in hostile silence. For a moment the Count stood motionless while he looked at each one in turn. Then he stepped forward. Good evening, gentlemen. I am honoured at your presence. He turned to the head waiter. Let dinner be served in five minutes exactly. With a bow, the man left the room. During that five minutes, gentlemen, I propose to introduce myself to you and you to one another. In silence, the three guests waited while he unwound the thick white muffler. Then, with undisguised curiosity, they studied their host. In profile, his face, with its short, dark beard, was aquiline and stern. The eyes, which had so impressed the manager, seemed now to be a cold grey-blue. The thick brown hair, flecked slightly with grey, was brushed back from a broad forehead. His hands were large and white and capable. The hands of a man who knew what he wanted, knew how to get it, and got it. The Count advanced first to the American, holding out his hand. Mr. Hocking, I believe. The American shook the proffered hand, while the two Germans looked at him with sudden interest. As the head of the great American Cotton Trust, worth more in millions than he could count, he was entitled to their respect. The Count turned to the taller of the two Germans. Herr Steinmann, is it not? The man, whose interest in German coal was hardly less well known than Hocking's in cotton, bowed stiffly. 
and Herr von Gratz? The Count turned to the last member of the party and shook hands. Von Gratz's name in the steel trade in Central Europe was one to conjure with. The nations of the world have recently been engaged in a performance of unrivaled stupidity, said the Count. And when idiots get busy on a large scale, it is time for clever men to step in. That is the raison d'etre for this little dinner. Gentlemen, I claim that we four are sufficiently international to be able to disregard any stupid and petty feelings about this country and that country, and to regard the world outlook from one point of view only, our own. As the gaunt American gave a hoarse chuckle, the head waiter opened the door and the four men sat down to dine. Finally, the coffee had been handed round and the door closed behind the waiter. Now, as the Count carefully cut the end of his cigar, he knew that the hardest part of the evening was in front of him. And gentlemen, we are all men of business. He turned to the two Germans. Though the central powers have been beaten by America and France and Britain, I believe it is neither France nor America with whom you two gentlemen desire another round. Britain is Germany's main enemy. Both Germans grunted assent. The Count turned to the American. Mr. Hawking, I have reason to believe that you personally do not love the British. I don't see what my private feelings have to do with it, but you are correct in your belief. Good. Gentlemen, what I am about to put before you is the defeat of Britain. A defeat more utter and complete than if she had lost the war. Don't think that I am proposing this merely through motives of revenge. We are businessmen, and revenge is worth our while only if it pays. This will pay. There is a force in Britain which, if harnessed and led properly, will result in millions coming to you. Harness that force, gentlemen, and use it for your own ends. Not only will you humble that cursed country to the dirt, but you will taste of power such as few men have tasted before. The Count stood up, his eyes blazing. And I, I will do it for you. He resumed his seat and leaned forward, glancing at the intent faces of his audience. Then he began to speak. Ten minutes later, he pushed back his chair. There is my proposal, gentlemen, in a nutshell. What is your answer? He rose and stood by the fire with his back to them. For several minutes, no one spoke. The three men were looking at the hands he had given them. What matter that only a master criminal could have conceived such a game? The only question which occupied their minds was whether he could carry it through. The American leaned back and stretched his legs. Count, you know who we are and what we're worth and all about us. Are you disposed to be a little more communicative about yourself? If we agree to come in on this hand, it's going to cost big money. The handling of that money is with you. Well, who are you? Von Gratz and Steinemann nodded in agreement. The Count turned and faced them. A very fair question, gentlemen, and yet one which I regret I am unable to answer. You will have to trust me, even as I shall have to trust you. You will have to trust me not to divert into my own pocket the money which you give me as working expenses. I shall have to trust you to pay me when the job is finished. And that payment, said Steinemann, that will be how much? One million pounds sterling, to be paid within one month of the completion of my work. After that, the matter will pass into your hands. And may you leave that cursed country groveling in the dirt. Von Gratz spoke. Perhaps, Count, you would be good enough to leave us for a few minutes. Why, well, certainly, gentlemen. The Count moved towards the door. I will return in ten minutes. 
By that time you will have decided one way or the other. When they had had their ten minutes, the Count re-entered and crossed to the fireplace. Well, gentlemen, what have you decided? It was the American who answered. We agree with one amendment. The money is too big for the three of us. There must be a fourth. That will be a quarter of a million each. The Count bowed. And we agree that it should be another of my countrymen. The man we've decided on is coming to England in a few weeks. His name is Hiram C. Potts. If you get him in, you can count us in too. If not, the deal's off. The Count nodded. I know of Mr. Potts. Your big shipping man, isn't he? I agree to your condition. Half an hour later, he entered his luxurious suite of rooms at the Hotel Magnificent. A girl, who had been lying by the fire reading, looked up. Successful, he said. Tomorrow, Irma, the Comte de Guy dies. And Carl Peterson and his daughter leave for England. A country gentleman, I think, is Carl Peterson. He might keep hens and possibly pigs. The girl rose, yawning. Mon Dieu, what a prospect! Pigs and hens! And in England! How long is it going to take? The Count looked thoughtfully into the fire. Perhaps a year. It is in the lap of the gods. Captain Hugh Drummond, DSO, MC, late of His Majesty's Royal Loamshears, was whistling in the morning bath. After a while, the musical gurgle of escaping water announced that the concert was over. It was the signal for James Denny, the square-jawed ex-Batman, to disappear into the back regions and get from his wife the kidneys and bacon which she had grilled to a turn. But on this particular morning, James Denny seemed preoccupied. He was staring out of the window to the other side of Half Moon Street. What's you looking for, James Denny? His wife was at the door. Them kidneys ready and waiting these five minutes. Her eyes fell on the table, and she advanced into the room, wiping her hands on her apron. Did you ever see such a bunch of letters? Forty-five, said her husband, and more to come. He picked up the newspaper lying beside the chair and opened it out. The result of that... He thrust the paper under his wife's nose. Demobilised officer, she read. Finding peace incredibly tedious would welcome diversion. Legitimate, if possible, but crime, if of a comparatively humorous description, no objection. Excitement essential, reply at once, box X-10. I call it, she announced. Crime. Don't you have nothing to do with it, Denny, my man, or you and me will be having words. A moment or two later, Hugh Drummond came in. Slightly under six feet in height, he was bored in proportion. His best friend would not have called him good-looking, but he was the fortunate possessor of that cheerful type of ugliness which inspires immediate confidence in its owner. His nose had never quite recovered from the final year in the public school's heavyweights, but his eyes, deep-set and steady, showed the man for what he was, a sportsman and a gentleman, and the combination of the two was an unbeatable production. Good morning, Mrs. Denny. Wherefore this worried look on your face? Has that reprobate James been misbehaving himself? She stared pointedly at the letters. He is not, sir. Not yet, leastwise. And she stalked from the room. The two men looked at one another. Is that their reference to crime, sir? said Denny. That's what's torn it. Hugh helped himself to bacon. Thinks I'm going to lead you astray, does she, James? Well, my dear fellow, you can think what she likes so long as she continues to grill bacon like this. Your wife, James, is a pearl amongst women, and you can tell her so with my love. He nodded at the letters. Go through them, James, and pick two or three out for me. As a first venture in our new career, ours, I said, James, love appeals to me irresistibly. Find me a damsel in distress, a beautiful girl, helpless in the clutches of knaves. As he finished the last piece of bacon and held himself to marmalade, his servant, engrossed in a letter he had just opened, suddenly sucked his teeth loudly.
His master looked up and removed the letter from his hands. My dear Box X-10, if your advertisement wasn't a joke, you're the man I want. I can offer you excitement and probably crime. I'm up against it, X-10. For a girl, I've bitten off rather more than I can chew. I want help, badly. Will you come to the Carlton for tea tomorrow afternoon? I want to see if you are genuine. Wear a white flower in your buttonhole. Drummond laid the letter down. Tomorrow? That's today. This very afternoon. Go out, my trusty fellow, and buy me a daisy or a cauliflower or something white. At four o'clock exactly, Hugh Drummond stepped out of his two-seater at the Haymarket entrance to the Carlton. A white gardenia was in his buttonhole. His grey suit looked the last word in exclusive tailoring. For a few moments after entering the hotel, he stood at the top of the stairs outside the dining room, while his eyes travelled round the tables in the lounge below. Suddenly his eyes ceased wandering and remained fixed on a table at the far end of the lounge. Half hidden behind a plant, a girl was seated alone. The table next to her was unoccupied and Drummond made his way towards it and sat down. He felt not the slightest doubt that this was the girl who had written to him. He could only see her profile, but her eyes were very blue and great masses of golden brown hair coiled over her ears from under a small black hat. He glanced at her hands and noted with approval the absence of any ring. Then he looked once more at her face and found her eyes fixed on him. Drummond fumbled in his waistcoat pocket. Taking out a card, he propped it up so that the girl could see what was on it. In large block capitals, he had written, Box X-10. She spoke almost at once. You'll do, X-10. Don't look round. And tell me your name quickly. Drummond. Captain Drummond, late of the Lomshires. My dear Phyllis, said a voice behind his back, this is a pleasant surprise. I had no idea that you were in London. A tall, clean-shaven man stopped beside the table, throwing a keen glance at Drummond. The world is full of such surprises, isn't it? said the girl. I don't suppose you know Captain Drummond, do you? Mr Lackington, art connoisseur and collector. The two men bowed slightly, and it struck Hugh that rarely, if ever, had he seen such a cold, merciless face. Lackington looked at his watch. Alas, I must tear myself away. Are you returning home this evening? The girl shrugged. Probably. I haven't quite decided. With a bow, Lackington turned away. Drummond noticed that the girl had gone a little white. What's the matter? Are you feeling faint? I'm all right. But you've stumbled right into the middle of it, Captain Drummond, rather sooner than I anticipated. That is one of the men you will probably have to kill. There's nothing like straightforward candour, he said. I didn't much care for his face or his manner, but why should I go to so much trouble? First and foremost, said the girl, the brute wants to marry me. I'm not surprised, said Hugh, but that isn't what matters. She looked at Drummond. Henry Lackington is the second most dangerous man in Britain. Only the second, murmured Hugh. Then hadn't I better start my new career with the first? She looked at him. Her blue eyes were very big, and the face they were set in was very charming. Altogether, Drummond reflected, a most adorable girl. Tell me all about it, he said. I'd better start with the sort of men you're up against. Firstly, Henry Lackington, the man who spoke to me. He was, I believe, a brilliant scientist. But he deliberately chose to turn his brain to crime. He regards crime as something to be treated as a mathematical problem. He is quite unscrupulous. He's only concerned in pitting himself against the world and winning. Why don't you tell the police, said Hugh. Because I've got no proof. But one day, my father and I were in his house, and by accident, I got into a strange room, with two large safes let into the wall and steel bars over the skylight in the ceiling. On the desk in the middle of the room lay some miniatures, and I picked them up. To my horror, I recognised them. Do you remember the theft of the celebrated Vatican miniatures belonging to the Duke of Melbourne? Drummond nodded. They were the ones I was holding in my hand, she said. I knew them at once from the description in the papers, and just as I was wondering what on earth to do, the man himself walked into the room. Awkward, said Drummond. What did he do? Nothing. A 
admiring my treasures, he remarked. Wonderful copies of the Duke of Melbourne's lost miniatures. I think they would deceive most people. They deceived me, I managed to say. He went over to one of the safes and unlocked it. Come here, Miss Benton, he said. There are a lot more copies. I looked inside only for a moment. Beautifully arranged on black velvet shelves were ropes of pearls, a gorgeous diamond tiara and a whole heap of loose, uncut stones. Then he shut the door and locked it. All copies, he said. And should you ever be tempted to think otherwise, ask your father, Miss Benton. And did you? said Drummond. She shuddered. That very evening, and Daddy flew into a frightful passion and told me never to dare meddle in things that didn't concern me again. I realised that Lackington had some hold over Daddy, that he'd got my father in his power. Her hands were clenched. That's not all. There was a man called George Dringer, and one evening, when Lackington was dining with us, I heard him discussing this man with Daddy. He's got to go, said Lackington. He's dangerous. And then my father got up and closed the door, but I heard them arguing for half an hour. Three weeks later, a coroner's jury found that George Dringer had committed suicide. There was another case, she said. Do you remember that man who was found dead in a railway carriage at Oxy Station? He was an Italian, Giuseppe by name, and the jury brought in a verdict of death from natural causes. A month before, he'd met Lackington at our house by chance. We lived next door to Lackington, and being a stranger, he'd come to the wrong house. Lackington had to be with us at the time. The interview finished with a fearful quarrel. She turned to Drummond. I know Lackington murdered him. Drummond did not answer immediately. What about this other man? he asked at length. The one you consider more dangerous still. I can tell you very little about him. He came to the Elms, that's the name of Lackington's house, three months ago. His name's Peterson. He's about medium height, rather thick set, clean shaven, with thick brown hairs, flecked slightly white. His eyes are a sort of cold grey blue. But it's his hands that terrify me. They're large and white and utterly ruthless. He frightens me to death. He would stop at nothing to gain his ends. Even Lackington himself knows that Mr. Peterson is master. Peterson, murmured Drummond. A sound old English name. Oh, the name is sound enough, but it's about as read his daughter. There's a lady in the case, then? By the name of Irma. She lies on a sofa in the garden and yawns. She's no more English than that waiter. And what is it that makes you think there's mischief ahead? Because my father hardly ever sleeps at night now. I hear him pacing up and down, hour after hour. I've just got to find out what the trouble is. I've got to get him away from those devils before he breaks down completely. We'd better go, said Drummond. My address is 60A Half Moon Street. My telephone is Mayfair 1234. If anything happens, if ever you want me, at any hour of the day or night... Bring me up. If I'm not in, leave a message with my servant, Denny. He is absolutely reliable. The only other thing is your address. The larch is near Godalming, answered the girl as they moved towards the door. Oh, if you only knew the glorious relief of feeling I've got someone to turn to. May I drop you anywhere? He asked as they stood on the pavement. She shook her head. No, thank you. I'll take that taxi. She gave the driver an address and stepped in. While I think of it, said Hugh, we're old friends. Can that be done? In case I come and stay, you see? She nodded. All right. We met a lot in London during the war. She drove off, leaving Hugh with a vivid picture imprinted on his mind of blue eyes and white teeth and a skin like the bloom of a sun-kissed peach. Next afternoon, Drummond's two-seater made short work of the run to Godalming. Under the dicky seat lay a small bag, and as Drummond thought of the two guns rolled up carefully in his pyjamas, he grinned gently. The girl had not rung him up during the morning, and after a comfortable lunch at his club, he'd started about three o'clock. 
the persistent honking behind caused him to pull into the side of the road. An open, cream-coloured Rolls-Royce drew level with five people on board. There were three people in the back, two men and a woman. And for a moment his eyes met those of the man nearest him. Then they drew ahead. With a slight frown he stared at the retreating car. The man whose eye he had caught as the Rolls went by was Henry Lackington. There was no mistaking that hard-lipped, cruel face. Presumably, thought Hugh, the other two occupants of the back seat were Mr Peterson and the doubtful daughter Irma. He followed in the big car's wake, accelerating up the hill. The next moment he braked hard and pulled up just in time. The rolls, with the chauffeur peering into the bonnet, had stopped in such a position that it was impossible for him to get by. The girl was still seated in the back of the car, also the passenger in front, but the two other men were standing in the road. Lackington came towards him. I'm so sorry, he began. Why? Surely it's Captain Drummond. The other man was now approaching, and Drummond regarded him curiously. Peterson, said Lackington as he came up, this is a friend of our little Phyllis. I found them having tea together yesterday at the Carlton. Peterson smiled. Any friend of Miss Benton's is, I hope, ours. I wonder if I can help your chauffeur, said Hugh. I'm a bit of an expert with the rolls. How very kind of you, said Peterson. I'll go and see. He went over to the man. Who's the quaint bird sitting beside the chauffeur, said Hugh. Wish to heaven I'd had a few more like him in France to turn into snipers. Why do you think he would have been a success at the job, said Lackington. Because he's so motionless. Bally fellow hasn't moved a muscle since I've been here. Great gift, Mr Lackington. Peterson called. All's well. And Lackington buttoned his coat. So long, said Hugh. Hope you don't break down again so suddenly. A few minutes later he was ringing the front doorbell at the larches. The maid ushered him into the drawing room and closed the door. It was a charming room. French windows led out onto a lawn, a few oak trees threw a pleasant shade at the end of the garden, and partially showing through them, he could see another house, which he rightly assumed was the Elms. In fact, even as he heard the door open and shut behind him, he saw Peterson come out of a small summer house smoking a cigar. He turned and faced Phyllis Benton. Oh, why have you come here, Captain Drummond? she said. It's terribly dangerous for you. If once those men suspect anything, God knows what will happen. They are so utterly unscrupulous, so fiendishly clever, that even you would be like a child in their hands. Have you seen the papers today? said Phyllis. She handed him a copy of The Planet. Read that. Hugh read it aloud. American millionaire Hiram C. Potts is sufficiently recovered from his recent illness to conduct business as usual. He looked at the girl sitting opposite. That man, she said, was stopping at the Carlton, where he met Lackington, and when multimillionaires get friendly with Lackington, their health frequently does suffer. But the paper says he's getting better, objected Drummond. Then why did he send his confidential secretary away yesterday morning on an urgent mission to Belfast? I phoned the Carlton this morning. They told me that Mr Potts was ill in bed and unable to see anybody, and that his secretary had left for Belfast that morning and would be away several days. There may be nothing in it. On the other hand, there may be a lot. And it's only by following up every possible clue that I can hope to beat those fiends and get Daddy out of their clutches. Drummond nodded. Into his mind had flashed suddenly the memory of that motionless figure seated by the chauffeur. The wildest guesswork, certainly, but can a millionaire be removed against his will in broad daylight from one of the biggest hotels in London to sit in immovable silence in an open car? The door opened, and an elderly man came in. Hugh rose. An old friend, Daddy, said Phyllis. You must have heard me speak of Captain Drummond. I, I don't recall the name at the moment, my dear, he said, but I, I fear I'm getting a little forgetful. I am pleased to meet you, Captain Drummond. You'll stop and have some dinner, of course. 
I should like to, Mr Benton. Thank you very much. I'm afraid the hour of my call was a little informal, but being in these parts, I felt I must come and look Miss Benton up. It cannot be said that dinner was a meal of sparkling gaiety. The atmosphere was strained, but Drummond rambled on, heedless of whether he was answered or not. All the time, though, his mind was busily working. He had already decided that his car had broken down, and his host could hardly fail to ask him to stop the night. And then, he had not yet quite settled how, he proposed to have a closer look at the elms. At length the meal was over. You'll have a glass of port, Captain Drummond, remarked his host, pushing the decanter towards him. As Hugh lifted the heavy cut glass, a cry half-shout, half-scream, came echoing through the open windows. The colour drained from his host's face. "'Wine, Miss Benton,' said Hugh. The girl was staring fearfully out of the window. "'Eerie noises these night birds make, don't they?' he said, and turned to his host with his tale of woe about his car. "'Of course you, you must stop here for the night,' said Mr Benton. Phyllis, my dear, will you tell them to get a room ready? It was half past eleven when Hugh entered the drawing room and pulled aside the curtains which covered the long windows. Cautiously, he unbolted one side of the big centre window and dodged across the lawn towards the big trees at the end. Leaning up against one of them, he proceeded to make a detailed survey of the elms. A wire fence separated the two houses, and in the darkness Hugh could just make out a small wicket gate closing a path which connected them. He tried it, and found to his satisfaction that it opened silently. Passing through, he saw that save for one room on the ground floor, Mr Lackington's abode was in darkness. Hugh determined to have a look at that room. Keeping under cover, he edged towards it. Seated at the table was a man he did not recognise, while on either side of him sat Lackington and Peterson. Lying on a sofa, smoking a cigarette and reading a novel, was a tall, dark girl. Hugh placed her at once as the doubtful daughter, Irma. A paper was in front of the man at the table, and Peterson was apparently suggesting that he should make use of the pen which Lackington was obligingly holding in readiness. A harmless tableau, save for the expression on the man's face. Hugh had seen it often, only then it had been called shell-shock. The man was semi-unconscious. Then Lackington produced an instrument from his pocket. Hugh saw the man shrink back in terror and reach for the pen. As he watched the man signing his name, no trace of emotion showed on Peterson's face. There was something inhuman in his passivity, whereas on Lackington's there shone a fiendish satisfaction. Hugh produced his revolver. He knew there was foul play about, and the madness of what he had suddenly made up his mind to do never struck him. The crack of the shot and the bursting of the only electric light bulb in the room were almost simultaneous. The next second, he burst through the window. At an immense advantage over the others, who could see nothing for the moment, he hit Lackington straight on the point of the jaw, and he felt the man go down like a log. Then he grabbed at the paper on the table, which tore in his hand. He picked the dazed signer up bodily and rushed through the window onto the lawn. As he reached the little gate, he paused and looked back. That instant, with a vicious foot, something buried itself in the tree beside him. Drummond lingered no longer. Barely had he burst back into the drawing room at the larches when the door opened and the girl rushed in. "'Get him away at once!' she cried. "'In your car! Don't waste a second! I've started her up!' "'Good girl. But what about you?' She stamped her foot impatiently. "'I'm absolutely all right. Get him away. That's all that matters!' Drummond grinned. "'I haven't an idea who this bird is, except that...' He paused, his eyes fixed on the man's left thumb. The top joint was crushed into a red, shapeless pulp, and suddenly the meaning of the instrument Lackington had produced from his pocket became clear, also the reason for that dreadful cry at dinner. "'By God,' whispered Drummond, "'a thumbscrew. The devils!' "'Quick,' urged the girl, "'they may be here at any moment.' She dragged him to the door, and together they forced the man into the car. "'Lackington won't be here,' said Hugh, "'and if you see him tomorrow... Don't ask after his jaw. Good night, Phyllis. 
He raised her hand to his lips, and he slipped in the clutch, and the car disappeared down the drive. Hugh Drummond was occupied with the piece of paper he had removed from Lackington's house the previous evening. Beyond establishing the fact that the man in bed in his flat, still in that peculiar dazed condition, was Hiram C. Potts, the American multi-millionaire, he could make nothing out of it. The scrap he had torn off was typewritten, save for the American's scrawled signature, but the odd words left on it made little sense. At twelve o'clock precisely, the doorbell rang. Announcing a visitor, and Drummond looked up from the columns of the sportsman as his servant came into the room. Yes, James, he said. We are at home. I want you to remain within call, and under no circumstance let our sick visitor out of your sight for more than a minute. In fact, I think you'd better sit in his room. James, with a curt, very good, sir, left the room. Almost at once he returned and announced Mr. Peterson. Drummond looked up quickly and rose with a smile. This is a very pleasant surprise, Mr. Peterson. He waved his visitor to a chair. Peterson smiled amiably. Captain Drummond, we've got to understand one another. Last night you removed something I require. Breaking the electric bulb with a revolver shot shows initiative. The blow which smashed Henry Lackington's jaw in two places shows strength. Qualities which I admire, Captain Drummond. I should dislike having to deprive the world of them. Drummond gazed at the speaker open-mouthed. My dear sir, are you really accusing me of being a sort of Wild West show? You've been to the movies too much, like my fellow James. Peterson's face, save for a slightly tired smile, was expressionless. Finally, Captain Drummond... You tore in half a piece of paper which I require and removed a very dear old friend of my family who is now in this house. I want them both back, please, and if you like, I'll take them now. Drummond shrugged. May I offer you a drink? Thank you, not at this hour. Peterson rose. I take it, then, that you will not return me my property here and now. I shall be ready to receive both the paper and the man up till six o'clock tonight at 32A Berners Street. And it is possible, I might even say probable, should they turn up by then, that I shall not find it necessary to kill you. When his visitor had left, Drummond gave himself over to some furious thinking. Finally, he pressed the bell. James, he said as the door opened. Potts must leave the house without being seen. He shall go to my cottage on the river, and you shall look after him. Yes, sir, returned James. Trot over the passageway and ask Mr. Durrell if he'll see me for a moment. A few minutes later, his neighbour and friend Peter Durrell strolled into the room. Peter, said Drummond, I want you to help me. All that I have, dear old flick, is yours for the asking. What can I do? Well, first of all, I want you to come along and see the household pet. He piloted Durrell along the passage to the American's room and opened the door. The millionaire looked at them dazedly from the pillows, and Durrell stared back in startled surprise. What's the matter with him? I would give a good deal to know, said Hugh. He smiled reassuringly at the motionless man and led the way back to the sitting room. Sit down, Peter, he said. Get outside that beer and listen to me carefully. Later that afternoon, Drummond sat down at his desk. First, he took the half-torn sheet out of his pocket, put it in an envelope, sealed it carefully, then he placed it in another envelope with a covering letter to his bank. Next, he took a sheet of notepaper and, with much deliberation, proceeded to pen a document which accorded him considerable amusement. This effusion he also enclosed in a sealed envelope, which he again addressed to his bank. Finally, he stamped the first but not the second, and placed them both in his pocket. The sun was getting low. Drummond's plans were well advanced, and the Denny's had long since left to fulfil their instructions, when a taxi drew up to the door leading to his apartment. Two men emerged. One was Peter Durrell, the other a stranger, and both were obviously quite well-oiled. They tacked up the stairs, singing lustily. Then, for a while, all went quiet. 
It was 11.30 that night when a sudden small sound, the sound he had been waiting for, made Hugh Drummond sit up in his chair, every nerve alert. Swiftly he opened his door and passed along the passage to where a motionless man lay in bed. Hugh switched on a small reading lamp and with a plate of semolina in his hand he turned to the recumbent figure. Hear him see, Potts, he said. Sit up and take your semolina. Force yourself, laddie, force yourself. His voice died away and he rose slowly. In the open door four men were standing each with a peculiar-shaped revolver in his hand. Before he could resist, a gag was thrust in Drummond's mouth and his hands were tied behind his back. Then, helpless, he watched three of them lift up the man from the bed and carry him out of the room. Move, said the fourth to Hugh. Drummond preceded his captor downstairs. As they reached the street, a large car drove up and in less time than it takes to tell, the two helpless men were pushed in, followed by the leader... The door was shut and the car drove off. At one o'clock, the car swung up to the elms. The invalid was lifted out and carried indoors. Drummond followed with dignified calmness and was led into a room off the hall. In a moment or two, Peterson entered, followed by his daughter. Ah, my young friend, cried Peterson. I hardly thought you'd give me such an easy run as this. He put his hands into Drummond's pockets and pulled out his revolver and a bundle of letters. To your bank, he murmured, not even stamped. Ungag him, Irma, and untie his hands. My very dear young friend, you pain me. He opened the envelope. As he pulled out the contents, a heavy crash came from the landing upstairs, followed by a flood of the most appalling language. I must apologise for my friend, murmured Hugh, but you must admit he has some justification. The next moment, the door burst open and an infuriated object rushed in. His hand was bandaged, showing a great red stain on the thumb. What the hell's going on? he yelled. You must ask our friend here, Mullings, said Hugh. He's got a peculiar sense of humour. Anyway, he's got the bill in his hand. They watched as Peterson opened the paper and read the contents. The girl leant over his shoulder. To Mr Peterson, the Elms, Godalming. To hire one demobilised soldier, five pounds. To making him drunk, five pounds. To bottle of red ink, one shilling. Total, ten pounds, one shilling. Irma laughed. Peterson's glance rested on the dishevelled man still standing by the door. After a moment's thought, he leaned forward and pressed a bell. Take that man away, he said to the servant who came into the room, and put him to bed. I will consider what to do with him in the morning. Consider be damned, howled Mullings, starting forward angrily. Do what the kind gentleman tells you, Mullings, said Hugh, and go to bed. As the door closed behind them, Peterson said, Where have you hidden pots? You probably realise from what has happened tonight that I am in earnest. I should be sorry to think so, answered Hugh. If that's the best you can do, I'd cut it right out and start a tomato farm. The girl gave a little gurgle of laughter and lit another cigarette. Will you come and do the dangerous part of the work for us, Monsieur Hugh? she asked. If you promise to restrain the little fellas, returned Hugh, I'll water them with pleasure. A sudden sound outside in the garden made him look up quickly. Peterson rose and walked over to the French windows. The next moment a man pushed them open and came unsteadily into the room. It was Mr Benton, and quite obviously he had been seeking consolation in the bottle. Who got him? he demanded, steadying himself with a hand on Peterson's arm. I have not, said Peterson. Perhaps if you ask your daughter's friend, Captain Drummond, he might tell you where he is. For heaven's sake, sit down, man, before you fall down. He pushed Benton roughly into a chair. We seem to be moving in an atmosphere of cross-purposes, Mr Benton, said Drummond. Our host will not get rid of the idea that I'm a species of bandit. I hope your daughter is quite well. Oh, uh, quite, thank you. 
Tell her, will you, that I propose to call on her before returning to London tomorrow? With his hands in his pockets, Peterson was regarding Drummond from the window. You propose leaving us tomorrow, do you? Drummond stood up. I ordered my car for ten o'clock. I hope, he continued, turning to the girl, who was laughing softly and polishing her nails, that this will not upset the household arrangements. Are we really losing you so soon? I am quite sure, said Hugh, that I shall be more useful to Mr Peterson at large than I am cooped up here. I might even lead him to this hidden treasure which he thinks I've got. For a while there was silence. It was broken at length by a short laugh from Peterson. Emma, is the blue room ready? If so, tell Luigi to show Captain Drummond to it. I will show him myself, she answered, rising. And then I shall go to bed. Mon Dieu, my Hugh, but I find your country très on you. She led the way to the door, and he followed her up the stairs. The house was beautifully furnished, the carpets were thick, the furniture solid and in exquisite toast. The girl opened the door of a room and switched on the light. Then she faced him, smiling, and Hugh looked at her steadily. Tell me, you ugly man, she murmured. Why are you such a fool? Hugh smiled, and Hugh's smile transformed his face. I must remember that opening, he said. It establishes a basis of intimacy at once, doesn't it? She put a hand on his shoulder. Don't you understand, she whispered, that they'll kill you. Go, you idiot. Go, while there's time. Her hand dropped to her side suddenly. Breakfast will be at nine, Mathieu. Until then, au revoir. He turned as she left the room, a little puzzled by her change of tone. Standing at the top of the stairs was Peterson, watching them both in silence. In the days when Drummond had been a platoon commander, he had specialised in stunts about which he was singularly reticent. Stunts over which his men formed their own conclusions and worshipped him accordingly. Drummond had realised the vital importance of fitting himself for these stunts. He practised in France till he could move over ground without a single blade of grass rustling. A Dutch trapper had first shown him how a man goes forward on his elbows like a snake and is here one moment and gone the next, with no one the wiser. And Hugh had practised till he could kill a man with his bare hands in a second. A Japanese had first taught him two or three of the secrets of his trade, and in the intervals of resting behind the lines he had perfected them, until it was even money whether the Jap or he would win in a practice bout. And there were nights in no man's land when his men would hear strange sounds, and knowing that Drummond was abroad on his wanderings, would peer over the parapet into the torn-up waste in front. Perhaps a patrol coming back would report a German lying huddled in a shell hole, with a broken neck. Perhaps the patrol never found anything. But whatever the report, Hugh Drummond only grinned and saw to his men's breakfasts. The result on Drummond was not surprising. As nearly as a man may be, he was without fear. And when the idea came to him, as he sat on the edge of his bed, to explore the house, no question of the possible risk entered into his mind. It was dark in the passage as he opened the door of his room and crept towards the top of the stairs. Like a huge shadow, he vanished into the blackness, feeling his way forward with the uncanny instinct that comes from much practice. For a moment his outline showed up against the faint grey light which was coming through a window halfway down the stairs. Then he was gone again, swallowed up in the gloom of the hall. As he had gone up to bed, he had noticed a door screened by a heavy curtain which he thought might be the room Phyllis Benton had spoken of, the room where Henry Lackington kept his ill-gotten treasures. He felt his way along the hall, and at length his hand touched the curtain, only to drop it again at once. From close behind him had come a sharp, angry hiss. Hugh drew from his pocket a tiny electric torch, holding it well away from his body, he switched it on. In the centre of the beam, swaying gracefully to and fro, was a snake. 
For a moment he watched it, fascinated, as it spat at the light angrily. He saw the flat hood where the vicious head was set on the upright body. Then he switched off the torch and retreated rather faster than he had come. A convivial household, he muttered to himself. A hooded cobra is an unpleasing pet. As he stood leaning against the banisters, regaining his self-control, a low chuckle came distinctly to his ears from the landing above. He flushed angrily in the darkness, suddenly realising that he was making the most profound fool of himself. He swore softly under his breath, then, as silently as he had come down, he commenced to climb the stairs again. He had a hazy idea that he would like to hit something. Hard. There were nine stairs in the first half of the flight, and it was as he stood on the fifth that something whizzed past his head so low that it almost touched his hair, and there was a clang on the wall beside him. He ducked instinctively, and, regardless of noise, raced up the remaining stairs on all fours. His jaw was set like a vice, his eyes were blazing. In fact, Hugh Drummond was seeing red. He paused when he reached the top, crouching in the darkness. Close to him he could feel someone else, and holding his breath, he listened. Then he heard the man move. Only the very faintest sound, but it was enough. Without a second's thought, he sprang, and his hands closed on human flesh. He laughed gently, and he fought in silence. His opponent was strong, but after a minute he was like a child in Hugh's grasp. He choked once or twice and muttered something. Then Hugh slipped his right hand gently onto the man's throat, and the man felt his head being forced back irresistibly. He gave one strangled cry, and then the pressure relaxed. One half inch more, my gentle humorist, whispered Hugh, and your neck would have been broken. As it is, it will be very stiff for some days. Another time, don't laugh, it's dangerous. Then, like a ghost, he vanished along the passage in the direction of his own room. At eight o'clock the next morning, a burly-looking ruffian brought in some hot water and a cup of tea. Hugh watched him through half-closed eyes. Suddenly he sat up in bed and stared at him. Good Lord, he cried. Aren't you Jem Smith? The man swung round like a flash. Why, strike me pink if it ain't young Drummond. Hugh grinned. Right in one, Jem. Giving up the game? It give me up when that cross-eyed son of a gun, young Baxter, threw that fight down at Oxton. God, if, if, if I could get the swine just once again, so help me, I'd... The... Words failed the ex-bruiser. Hugh, who remembered the real reason why the game had given Jem up, and a period of detention at His Majesty's expense had taken its place, preserved the discreet silence. The pug paused as he got to the door. It ain't none of my business, he muttered. But seeing as how you're one of the boys, if I was you... I won't get looking so close at things in this here house. It ain't healthy. Hugh smiled. Thank you, Jem. By the way, has anyone got a stiff neck in the house this morning? Funny you asked, said Jim. The bloke's sitting up in his bed swearing awful. He can't move his head at all. And who might ask is the bloke, said Drummond. Peter Senecals. Who else? Breakfast at nine. Only Peterson was in the dining room when Hugh came down. He had examined the stairs on his way, but he could see nothing which would account for the thing which had whizzed past his head and clanged against the wall. Nor was there any sign of the cobra by the curtain door. Good morning, remarked Hugh affably. By Jove, that coffee smells good. Help yourself, said Peterson. May I press you to a kidney, said Hugh. He returned politely towards his host and paused in dismay. Good heavens, Mr. Peterson, is your neck hurting you? It is. Oh, nuisance. Having a stiff neck makes everyone laugh and one gets no sympathy. Bad thing, laughter. At times, anyway. He sat down and commenced to eat his breakfast. Curiosity is a great deal worse, Captain Drummond. 
It was touch and go whether I killed you last night. From the moment you left the bottom of the stairs, I had your life in the palm of my hand. Had I chosen to take it, my young friend, I should not have had this stiff neck. Hugh returned to his breakfast. Granted, laddie, but had I not been of such a kindly and forbearing nature, you wouldn't have had it either. Peterson, with his coffee cup in his hand, was staring down the drive. Your car is a little early, Captain Drummond. However, perhaps it can wait two or three minutes while we get matters perfectly clear. He turned and faced the soldier. You have deliberately, against my advice, elected to fight me and the interests I represent. So be it. From now on, the gloves are off. You embarked on this course from a spirit of adventure at the instigation of the girl next door. She, poor little fool, is concerned over that drunken waster her father. She asked you to help her. You agreed. And, amazing though it may seem, up to now you have scored a certain measure of success. I admit it, and I admire you for it. But you are completely in the dark. You have no idea whatever what you are up against. He smiled grimly and turned abruptly on Hugh. You fool. You stupid young fool. Do you really imagine that you can beat me? Drummond rose. I'm completely in the dark as to your plans. But anyone who can employ a thumbscrew on a poor defenceless brute seems to me the lowest type of degraded criminal. You have kindly warned me of my danger. Let me give you a word of advice in my turn. I'm going to fight you. If I can, I'm going to beat you. Anything that may happen to me is part of the game. But if anything happens to Miss Benton during the course of operations, then as surely as there is a god above, Peterson, I'll get at you somehow and murder you with my own hands. For a few moments there was silence. Then Drummond stepped out into the warm sunshine and spoke to his chauffeur. Take her into the main road, Jenkins, and wait for me outside the entrance to the next house. I shan't be long. Then he strolled through the garden towards the little wicket gate that led to the larches and Phyllis. The thought of her was singing in his heart. Why on earth did you come back here? said Phyllis. Don't you realise that if anything happens to you, I shall never forgive myself? The soldier smiled reassuringly. Don't worry, he said. Years ago I was told by an old gypsy that I should die in my bed of old age and excessive consumption of invalid port. As a matter of fact, the cause of my visit was rather humorous. They abducted me in the middle of the night with an ex-soldier of my old battalion, who was, I regret to state, sleeping off the effects of too much liquor in my rooms. What are you talking about? she said. They thought he was your American millionaire cove, and the wretched Mullings was too drunk to deny it. In fact, I don't think they ever asked his opinion at all. How splendid! cried the girl. And where was the American? Next door, safe with a dear old friend of mine, Peter Durrell. You must meet Peter some day. You'll like him. And where's the American now? Many miles out of London, said Hugh. I think we'll leave it at that. The less you know, Phyllis, the better. And in the meantime, I want you to keep an eye on what goes on next door and let me know anything of importance by letter to the Junior Sports Club. She looked up at Drummond. I don't know whether it's worth mentioning, but yesterday afternoon, four men came at different times to the Elms... They were the sort of type one sees tub-thumping in Hyde Park. Hugh shook his head. Hmm. Don't seem to help much, does it? Still, one never knows. Let me know anything like that in future at the club. Good morning, Miss Benton. Peterson's voice behind them made Drummond swing round. Our inestimable friend, Captain Drummond, brought such a nice young fellow to see me last night and then left him lying about the house this morning. Hugh bit his lip with annoyance. Until that moment he had clean forgotten that Mullings was still in the elms. I have sent him along to your car, said Peterson. I'm afraid, Mullings, said Drummond, as he pulled up in front of his club in the centre of London, that the kindly gentleman with whom we spent last night refuses to meet the bill I gave him for your services. 
Just wait here a moment. He went inside and returned in a few moments with a folded cheque. Round the corner, Mullings. An obliging fellow in a black coat will shove you out the necessary Bradbury's. The man glanced at the cheque. It's fifty quid, sir. It's too much. The labourer, Mullings, is worthy of his hire. You have been of the very greatest assistance to me, and, incidentally, it is more than likely that I may want you again. Now, where can I get hold of you? 13 Green Street, Oxton, sir, will always find me. And any times as you want me, sir, I'd like to come just for the sport of the thing. Hugh grinned. Good lad, and it may be sooner than you think. Inside the junior sports club, Hugh Drummond was burying his nose in a large tankard of the ale as a waiter arranged the evening papers on a table. Hugh beckoned him to bring one. He glanced over the columns. Cricket, racing, the latest divorce case, the latest strike, all the usual headings. He was just putting down the paper when a paragraph caught his eye. Belfast murder. The body discovered near the docks has been identified as James Granger, confidential secretary to Hiram Potts, the American multimillionaire at present in this country. Mr Potts, who has recently been indisposed, has returned to the Carlton and is greatly upset at the tragedy. Drummond laid the paper on his knees. Now, that's very interesting, as I was under the impression that Mr Potts was safely tucked up in bed, consuming semolina pudding at Goring. A few minutes later, he was in the telephone box. Peter, don't mention any names, but our guest is with you, is he? Good. I'll be down later and we'll have a powwow. He stepped out of the box. If, Algy, he remarked to a man who was looking at the tape machine outside, the paper says a blighter's somewhere and you know he's somewhere else, what do you do? Up to now in such cases, murmured Algy Longworth, I I've always shot the editor. Come and feed. You're so helpful, Algy. Do you want a job? What sort of a job? demanded Longworth as they strolled into the luncheon room. Long after the cheese had been finished, Algy Longworth was still listening in silence to his companion. My dear old Bean, he murmured as Hugh finished, this is the most marvellous thing I ever heard. Enrolled me as a member of the band, and incidentally, Toby Sinclair's running around in circles asking for trouble. Let's rope him in. Go and find him this afternoon, Algy, said Hugh, rising, and tell him to keep his mouth shut. I'd come with you, but it occurs to me that the wretched Potts, bathed in tears at the Carlton, is in need of sympathy. So long, old dear. You'll hear from me in a day or two. Mr Potts will soon know one, sir, said the receptionist. You are about the twentieth gentleman who has been here already today. Hugh smiled genially. Newspaper men, I'm not. If you will have this note delivered to Mr Potts, I think he will see me. He sat down at the table, drew a sheet of paper towards him and wrote rapidly. Urgent. A message from headquarters. Then he sat back to wait. After what seemed an interminable delay, he saw the messenger crossing the lounge. Mr Potts will see you, sir. Will you come this way? When Hugh stepped inside the room, he stopped with an involuntary gasp of surprise. The man seated in the chair was Potts, to all intents and purposes. The likeness was extraordinary, and had he not known that the real article was at Goring, he would have been completely deceived. The man waited till the door was closed. I don't know you, he said. Who are you? Since when has everyone employed by headquarters known one another, said Drummond. It wasn't like Roscoe to bungle in Belfast, said the man. He had plenty of time to do the job properly. I agree, said Drummond. The issues are far too great for any failure. You're right, my friend, you're right. Long live the Brotherhood. He stared out of the window with smouldering eyes, and Hugh preserved a discreet silence. Then suddenly the other broke out again. Have they not killed that insolent puppy of a soldier yet? Er, uh, not yet, murmured Hugh. They must find the American at once. The man thumped the table. It was important before, at least his money was. Now with this blunder it's vital. However, you have a message for me, what is it? Hugh rose. He'd got more out of the interview than he'd hoped for, and there was nothing to be gained by prolonging it. 
But something suddenly aroused the other's suspicions, and with a snarl of fury he sprang past Hugh to the door. Who are you? He whipped an ugly-looking knife out of his pocket. Hugh grinned gently. I'm the insolent puppy of a soldier, dear old bird, he remarked, edging towards the other man, who crouched, snarling by the door. The penalty of failure is death, isn't it, dear one? he said. Such is your rule. And I think you have failed, haven't you? How will they kill you, I wonder? It was at that moment that the man made his mistake. He looked away. Only for a moment, but it was enough. Quick as any dog, Hugh sprang. With his left hand, he seized the man's right wrist. With his right, he seized his throat. Then he forced him upright against the door. Little by little, the grip of his right hand tightened till the other's eyes were staring from his head. It would be so easy to kill you now, said Hugh, but they know me downstairs and it would make it so awkward when I wanted to dine here again. So, taking everything into account, I think... There was a sudden lightning movement, a heave and a quick jerk. The impersonator of Potts was dimly conscious of flying through the air and of hitting the floor some yards from the door. Doubled up and groaning, he watched Hugh make for the door. A few moments later, Hugh was crossing the tea lounge. Almost unconsciously, he glanced towards the table where three days before he had had tea with Phyllis Benton and had been more than half inclined to believe that the whole thing was an elaborate leg pull. Why, Captain Drummond? A well-known voice from a table at his side made him look down. Irma Peterson was regarding him with a mocking smile. He glanced at her companion, a young man whose face seemed vaguely familiar and whose expression was not one of unalloyed pleasure at the interruption of his tete-a-tete. -tete. Drummond bowed to her. She waved a charming hand in farewell and turned to her companion. But Drummond, though he went into the hall outside, did not immediately leave the hotel. Instead, he buttonholed an exquisite being arrayed in gorgeous apparel and led him to a point of vantage. You see that girl having tea at the third table from the big palm? Now, can you tell me who her companion is? I seem to know his face, but I can't put a name to it. That, sir, murmured the exquisite being, is the Marquis of Laidley. His lordship is frequently here. Laidley, cried Hugh, the Duke of Lampshire's son. The plot thickens. As he stepped into Pall Mall, clean before his memory came three lines on the scrap of paper he had torn from the table at the Elms. When he had grabbed the dazed millionaire from under Peterson's nose, they included the word necklace and the word lamp. Now he saw the connection. The Duchess of Lampshire's pearls were world famous. The Marquis of Laidley was apparently enjoying his tea with Carl Peterson's daughter. I'm glad you two fellows came down, said Hugh as he entered the sitting room of his bungalow at Goring. Dinner was over and stretched in three chairs were Peter Durrell, Algie Longworth and Toby Sinclair. Two dogs lay curled up on the mat asleep. Mrs Denny has just told me that a man came here this afternoon. He said it was about the water and then I told him to come. Unfortunately, I'd done nothing of the sort. His three listeners sat up and stared at him. What do you mean, Hugh? asked Toby Sinclair. I should say that about five hours ago, Peterson found out that our one and only Hiram C. Potts was upstairs. Good Lord, said Durrell. How the devil has he done it? I suppose it wasn't very difficult for him to find out that I had a bungalow here. What do we do, Sergeant Major? said Algy. We take it in turns, two at a time, to sit up with Potts. Hugh glanced at the other three. Damn it, you blighters, wake up! Durrell struggled to his feet. I don't know what it is, he said, rubbing his eyes. I feel most infernally sleepy. Well, listen to me, confound you. Toby, it's, it's, it's far too, too dangerous to leave the... His head dropped forward on his chest. A short, half-strangled snore came from his lips. It had the effect of waking him for the moment, and he staggered to his feet, 
The other three, sprawling in their chairs, were asleep. Even the dogs lay inert as logs. Wake up! shouted Hugh. For God's sake, wake up! We've been drugged. An iron weight seemed to be pressing down on his eyelids. The desire for sleep grew stronger and stronger. Then, just before unconsciousness overcame him, there came to his bemused brain the sound of a whistle thrice repeated from outside the window. With a last stupendous effort, he fought his way towards it. Dim figures were moving through the shrubs. Suddenly, one detached itself, and the light fell on the man's face. His nose and mouth were covered with a pad, but the cold, sneering eyes were unmistakable. Lackington, gasped Hugh, and then he collapsed. Lackington, his face pressed against the glass outside, watched in silence. Draw the curtains. Said Lackington, and one of the men did as he said. There were four in all, each with a similar pad over his mouth and nose. Where did you put the generator, Brownlow? In the coal skull. The man carefully lifted a small black box out of the scuttle and shook it gently. It's finished, he remarked. Lackington dropped the box into his pocket. Go and get him, he ordered, and tie the others up. They left the room, and Lackington went to the window and stared down at Drummond. In his eyes was a look of cold fury, and he kicked the unconscious man savagely in the ribs. "You young swine! Do you think I'll forget that blow on the jaw?" "All right, he's in the car." A voice came from outside the window, and Lackington turned away. "Then we'll go." Au revoir, my blundering young bull. Before I've finished with you, you'll scream for mercy, and you won't get it. On arrival at the junior sports club next morning, the four men sank into four large chairs and pondered gently on the vileness of the morning after, especially when there hadn't been a night before. As luncheon was announced, Hugh got to his feet. Are we better? No, murmured Toby. But I am beginning to hope that I may live. Four martinis, and then we'll gnaw a cutlet. Has it struck you, fellows? Remarked Hugh at the conclusion of lunch. That seated round this table are four officers who fought with some distinction and much discomfort in the recent historic struggle, and that last night we were done down, trampled on, had for mugs by a crowd of dirty blackguards. A veritable Solomon," said Algy, gazing at him admiringly through his eyeglass. "Has it still further struck you?" went on Hugh, "that we aren't standing for it. I propose that we should tackle the blighters tonight." "Tonight," echoed Durell. "Where?" "At the Elms, of course. That's where the wretched Potts is for certainty." "And how do you propose that we should set about it?" demanded Sinclair. Drummond drained his port and grinned gently. By stealth, dear old beans, you and I thought we might rake in Ted Jerningham and perhaps Jerry Seymour to join the happy throng. We'll make a demonstration in force, with the idea of drawing off the enemy, thereby leaving the coast clear for me to explore the house for the unfortunate Potts. What do you mean by a demonstration? Said Longworth. Pay attention, all of you," said Hugh. Tonight, sometime about ten of the clock, Algy's motor will proceed along the Goddam and Guildford Road. It will contain you three, also Ted and Jerry Seymour, if we can get them. On approaching the gates of the Elms, you will render the night hideous with your vocal efforts. Stray passers-by will think that you are tight. Then will come the dramatic moment when, with a heavy crash, you ram the gate. How awfully jolly," said Algy. I beg to move that your car be used for the event. Can't be done, old son," said Hugh. "I'll be wanting it myself. Now to proceed. Horrified at this wanton damage to property, you will leave the car and proceed in mass formation up the drive. Either Ted or Jerry or both will approach the house and inform the owner in heart. 
broken accents that they have damaged his gatepost. You three will remain in the garden. You might be recognised. Then it will be up to you. You'll have several men all around you. Keep them occupied. I think that ten minutes will be enough for me. I may find pots. I may not. But when you have given me ten minutes, you clear off. I'll look after myself. Now, is that clear? Hugh stopped his car at Guildford Station and strolled restlessly up and down. He looked at his watch a dozen times in two minutes. Over the telephone, he had arranged that she should come by train from Godalming to confer with him on a matter of great importance. She had said she would, but what was it? He, having no suitable answer ready, had made a loud buzzing noise and rung off. And now he was waiting. At length, the train was signalled, and Hugh got back into his car. He scanned the faces of the passengers as they came out into the street, until, with a sudden quick jump of his heart, he saw her, cool and fresh, coming towards him with a faint smile. What is this very important matter you want to talk to me about? She demanded as he adjusted the rug round her. It was chilly in the open-top sports car. I'll tell you when we get out on the hog's back, he said, slipping in his clutch. It's absolutely vital. Once or twice he looked at her out of the corner of his eye. Except for their first meeting at the Carlton, it was the only time he had ever had her completely to himself, and Hugh felt as if he could go on driving for ever, just he and she alone. He had an overwhelming longing to take her in his arms. It was then that the girl turned and looked at him. Let's stop, she said. Then you can tell me. Hugh drew into the side of the road and switched off the engine. If the girl saw his hand trembling a little as he opened the door, she gave no sign. He came and stood beside her, his arm lying along the seat just behind her shoulders. Tell me about this important thing, she said. He smiled, and no woman yet born could see Hugh Drummond smile without smiling too. You darling, he whispered. You adorable darling. His arm closed around her, and almost before she realised it, she felt his lips on hers. For a moment she sat motionless, then, with a little gasp, she pushed him away. You mustn't, you. And why not, darling? Don't you know I love you? But it's only two or three days since we met, she said. And what the devil has that got to do with it at all? he demanded. She felt herself lifted bodily out of the car and lying in his arms, with Hugh's eyes looking very tenderly into her own. With a sudden, quick movement, she put both her arms round his neck and kissed him on the mouth. Is that good enough? she asked. At a quarter to ten, he backed his car into the shadow of some trees, not far from the gate of the elms. The sky was overcast, which suited his purpose, and through the gloom of the bushes he dodged rapidly towards the house. From a downstairs room on one side came the hoarse sound of men's voices, and he placed that as the smoking room of the gang of ex-convicts and blackguards who formed peace and staff. There was one bedroom light at the back of the house, and thrown on the blind he could see the shadow of a man. As he watched, the man got up, and moved away, only to return in a moment or two and take up his old position. It's one of those two bedrooms, he muttered to himself, if he's here at all. Crouching in the shadow of some shrubs, he peered at his watch. It was just ten o'clock. The trees were creaking gently in the faint wind. All around him the strange night noises were whispering and muttering. And once again the thrill of the night stalker gripped him. He remembered the German who had lain motionless for an hour in a little gully, while he, from behind a stunted bush, had tried to locate him. And then that one creak as the Bosch had moved his leg. And then the end. No, the night held no terrors for him, only a fierce excitement. At last, faintly in the distance, he heard the hum of a car. Rapidly it grew louder, and he smiled grimly to himself as the sound of five unmelodious voices singing lustily struck his ear. They passed along the road in front of the house. There was a sudden crash, then silence, but only for a moment. 
Peter's voice came first. You priceless old ass! you've rammed the blinking gate. It was Jerry Seymour who then took up the ball. Ah, we must go and apologise to the owner. Quite unpardonable. You can't go about country knocking down gates. Half consciously, Hugh listened. But now that the moment for action had come, every faculty was concentrated on his own job. He saw half a dozen men go rushing out into the garden through a side door, and then two more ran out and came crashing past him. For an instant, he wondered what they were doing. A little later, he was destined to find out. Then came a peal at the front doorbell, and he determined to wait no longer. He darted through a door to find a flight of back stairs in front of him, and in another moment he was on the first floor. He walked rapidly along the landing. Turning a corner, he found himself at the top of the main staircase, the spot where he had fought Peterson two nights previously. He walked quickly onto the room, which he calculated was the one where he had seen the shadow on the blind. He flung the door open. There, lying in the bed, was the American, while crouched beside him, with a revolver in his hand, was a man. The man leapt up and raised his revolver. Then, the unexpected happened. A jet of liquid ammonia struck him full in the face. With a short laugh, Hugh dropped his water pistol in his pocket and turned his attention to the bed. Wrapping the millionaire in a blanket, he picked him up and, paying no attention to the man gasping and choking in a corner, he raced for the back stairs. Down he ran and into the garden. Everything had fallen out exactly as he hoped. But had hardly dared to expect. He heard Peterson's voice in the house behind him, calm and suave as usual, answering Jerry. Not a soul was in sight. The back of the house was clear. All he had to do was walk quietly through the wicket gate to the larches, with his semi-conscious burden, get to his car and drive off. It all seemed so easy. But there were one or two factors that he had forgotten. The first was the man upstairs. The window was thrown up suddenly, and the man leaned out, waving his arms, still gasping with the strength of the ammonia. Then, from the trees close by, there came the sharp clang of metal. With a quick catch at his breath, he began to run. Now, the two men who had rushed past him before he entered the house had become the principal danger. As he ran on, he heard something crash into a bush on his right and give a snarl of anger. Like a flash, he swerved into the undergrowth on the left. Then began a dreadful game. He was still some way from the fence, and he was hampered at every step by the man slung over his back. He could hear the thing blundering about, searching for him. Suddenly, with a cold feeling of fear, he realised that the animal was in front of him, that his way to the gate was barred. The next moment, it came out into the open, and he saw it, and he knew it had seen him. Grotesque and horrible, it crouched on the ground. He could hear its heavy breathing as it waited for him to move. Cautiously, he lowered the millionaire to the ground and took a step forward. It was enough. With a snarl of fury, the crouching form rose and shambled towards him. Two hairy arms shot towards his throat. He smelt the brute's fetid breath, hot and loathsome, and he realised what he was up against. It was a partially grown gorilla. For a full minute they fought in silence, save for the hoarse grunts of the animal as it tried to tear away the man's hand from its throat and then encircle him with its powerful arms. With his brain cold as ice, Hugh kept his head. There was only one chance of finishing it quickly, the grip taught him by the Japanese olaki. He shifted his left thumb an inch or two on the brute's throat, then, little by little, the fingers moved, and the grip, which had been tight before, grew tighter still. Back went its head. Something was snapping in its neck. With a scream of rage, it wrapped its legs round Drummond, squeezing and writhing. And then suddenly there was a tearing snap, and the great limbs relaxed and grew limp. With a gasp of utter exhaustion, the man dropped on the ground himself. He was utterly cooked. Even Peterson's voice close behind scarcely roused him. Quite one of the most amusing entertainments I've seen for a long time. He looked up wearily. 
and he saw that he was surrounded by men. Drummond scrambled unsteadily to his feet. I've forgotten your damn menagerie, I must confess. He glanced at the men who had closed in round him. What's the party for? A guard of honour, my young friend, said Peterson, to lead you to the house. Well, don't leave the wretched pots lying about, said Hugh. I dropped him over there. Drummond paused for a moment at the door of the sitting room. Irma's accustomed place on the sofa was occupied by an unkempt-looking man with a ragged beard. At the end of the table sat Lackington, regarding him with malevolent fury. Along each side were a half a dozen men, some obviously foreigners, some anything from murderers to Sunday school teachers. Peterson's voice came from just behind his shoulder. Permit me, gentlemen, to introduce to you Captain Drummond the originator of the little entertainment we have just had. Hugh bowed. So, this is the insolent young swine, is it? The bloodshot eyes of a man with a scarred face turned on him. Why hasn't he been killed? He very nearly was last night, said Lackington. But I decided it would be much too easy a death. It can be remedied tonight. Peterson took an empty chair next to Lackington. Sit down, he said. Hugh bowed and sat. For a moment there was silence in the room. It was broken by the unkempt man on the sofa. What this young man has done, I know not, and I care less. In Russia such trifles do not matter. Did we not kill thousands? Yes, tens of thousands of his kind, before we obtained the great freedom. Are we not going to do the same in this accursed country? What is this wretched man that he should interrupt the great work even for one second? Kill him now. Throw him in a corner and let us proceed. There was a murmur of approval, in which Hugh joined heartily. Splendid! A magnificent peroration. Am I right, sir? in assuming that you are what is vulgarly known as a Bolshevist. The man turned his sunken eyes, glowing with the fire of fanaticism on Drummond. I am one of those fighting for the freedom of the world, he cried, for the rights of the proletariat. The workers were the bottom dogs in Russia till they killed the rulers. Now they are free. Now. They rule. The growing excitement filled Hugh's mind. Could it be possible that Peterson was organising a deliberate plot to Bolshevise England? If so, where did the Duchess of Lampshire's pearls come in? And what of the American Hiram Potts? Above all, what did Peterson hope to make out of it himself? Peterson regarded him with a faint smile. A little difficult to understand, isn't it, Captain Drummond? I told you you'd find yourself in deep water. The time has come for you to retire for the night, my young friend. He stood up, walked over to the bell behind Hugh, and rang it. Then I will say good night, he said. Is it the same room that I had last time? No, said Peterson. A different one, specially prepared for you. If you get to the top of the stairs... A man will show you where it is. He opened the door and stood there smiling, and at that moment all the lights went out. Hugh remained motionless. Then someone brushed past him. Like a flash, Hugh's hand shot out and gripped him by the arm. The man wriggled and twisted, but he was powerless as a child, and Hugh found his throat with his other hand. Holding the unknown man in front of him, he reached the foot of the stairs, and there he paused. He suddenly remembered the mysterious thing which had whizzed past his head that other night. He had gone up five stairs when it had happened. If it's you or me, laddie, said Hugh, I guess it's got to be you. With a quick heave, he jerked the man off his feet and lifted him up till his head was above the level of his own. Then, clutching him tight, 
he commenced to climb. As he reached the fifth step, something hit the neck of the man he was holding with such force that it wrenched him clean out of his arms. Then came a clang beside him, and with a series of ominous thuds, a body rolled down the stairs into the hall below. He heard Lackington's voice. You fool! You've killed him! Switch on the light! But before the order could be carried out, Hugh had disappeared like a great cat into the darkness of the passage above. He had at the most a minute to get clear. As luck would have it, the first room he darted into was empty, and he flung up the window and peered out. It was a dormer window. Access to the roof was easy. Without an instant's hesitation, he abandoned all thoughts of retreat. When two excited men rushed into the room, he was firmly ensconced, with his legs astride the ridge of the window, not a yard from their heads. Securely hidden in the shadow, he watched the subsequent proceedings with genial toleration. In half a minute the garden was full of hurrying figures. Peterson went over to the Benton house and returned in a few minutes. He's not over there. The men had gathered together in a group just below where Hugh was sitting. Do you mean to say we've lost the young swine again? said Lackington. Not lost, murmured Peterson. Merely mislaid. It was half an hour before Drummond decided that it was safe to start exploring. The house, he discovered, was built on a peculiar design. The ridge on which he had sat continued at the same height all round the top of the roof. In the middle, the roof sloped down to a flat space from which stuck up a glass structure. With the utmost caution, Hugh lowered himself to the level space around the glass roof. He had no doubt that he was now above the secret room that Phyllis had told him of. He leant forward cautiously and peered in. In an armchair sat Peterson. He was reading a letter and occasionally underlining some point with a pencil. Beside him on a table was a big ledger, and every now and then he would turn over a few pages and make an entry. But it was not Peterson on whom the watcher above was concentrating his attention. It was Lackington and the thing beside him on the sofa. Lackington was in his shirt sleeves, and on his hands he wore what looked like rubber gloves, stretching right up to his elbows. He was bending over a long bath, full of some light brown liquid from which a faint vapour was rising, and shaking in some white powder. As the liquid commenced to froth and bubble, Peterson stood up. Are you ready? he said, taking off his coat and picking up a pair of gloves similar to those the other was wearing. They approached the sofa, and Hugh, with a kind of fascinated horror, forced himself to look. For the thing that lay there was the body of the man who'd been killed in his arms. The two men carried the body to the bath and dropped it into the fuming liquid. Then they peeled off their long gloves and stood watching. Gradually the body commenced to disappear. Within a minute... The liquid was almost clear. Lackington took a red velvet box out of a drawer in the desk and opened it lovingly. Hugh saw the flash of diamonds as Lackington let the stones run through his hands. Peterson watched him contemptuously. Baubles, he said. Pretty baubles. What will you get for them? Ten, perhaps fifteen thousand. It is not the money I care about. It's the delight in having them and the skill required to get them. The sound of a door opening made both men swing round. Then Peterson stepped forward with a smile. Back, my dear. I hardly expected you so soon. Irma came a little way into the room and stopped with a sniff of disgust. What a horrible smell. What on earth have you been doing? Disposing of a corpse, said Lackington. It's nearly finished. The girl peered over the edge of the bath. It's not my ugly soldier, she cried. Unfortunately not, said Lackington. Peterson laughed. <laughs> Henry is most annoyed, Irma. The irrepressible Drummond has scored again. 
In a few words, he told the girl what had happened, and she clapped her hands together delightedly. Assuredly, I shall have to marry that man, she cried. He is quite the least boring individual I have met in this atrocious country. She sat down and lit a cigarette. I saw Walter tonight. He came over from Paris especially to see you. They want you in Paris for a meeting at the Ritz. Peterson frowned. It's most inconvenient. Did he say why? Amongst other things, I think they are uneasy about the American. My dear man, you can easily slip over for a day. She turned to Lackington. Your fish is hooked, mon ami. He has already proposed, and he has introduced me to a dreadful-looking woman who has adopted me as her niece for the great occasion. What great occasion? said Lackington. Why, he's coming of age, said the girl. I am to go to Ledley Towers next Saturday as an honoured guest of the Duchess of Lampshire. What do you think of that, my friend? The old lady will be wearing pearls and all complete in honour of the great day, and I shall be one of the admiring house party. Lackington turned a handle underneath the bath, and the liquid, now clear and still, commenced to sink rapidly. Fascinated, he watched the process. In two minutes, the bath was empty. A human body had completely disappeared without leaving a trace. Now, what about bed? said Lackington. Not yet, said Peterson. I must see the Yank before I go to Paris. We'll have him down here now, and we'll make the fool sign. Then I can actually take it over to the meeting with me. He strode to the door, followed by Lackington. For a moment or two, Hugh watched the girl. Then he stood upright and eased his cramped limbs. Something of the diabolical plot conceived by Peterson was beginning to take shape in his mind, and with this knowledge, had come the realization that the thing had become a national affair. Britain herself, her very existence, was threatened by one of the vilest plots ever dreamed of in the brain of man. And then he realized that even now he had nothing definite to go on. He must know more. Somehow or other, he must get to Paris. He must attend that meeting at the Ritz. A sound from the room below brought him back to his vantage point. The American was sitting in a chair, and Lackington, with a hypodermic syringe in his hand, was holding his arm. Gast your signature to a little agreement by which, in return for certain services, you promise to join us in our uh, labours. I refuse, cried the millionaire. I refuse, absolutely. The trouble is, my friend, that you must be in with us, otherwise you might wreck the scheme. Therefore, I require your signature. The millionaire stared round the room like a trapped animal. And then the unexpected happened. There was a crash of glass. Lackington sprang aside and looked up. Potts, my boy, don't you sign. Lackington darted from the room, followed more slowly by Peterson, and then occurred one of those strokes of luck on which the incorrigible soldier always depended. The girl left the room as well, kissing her hand towards him as she went. I am going out to get a really good view of the kill. The next moment, Potts was alone, staring up at the skylight. Go out of the room. Turn to the right. Open the front door. You'll see a house through some trees. Go to it. When you get there, stand on the lawn and call Phyllis. Do you get me? The American nodded. Go at once. It's your only chance. Tell her I'm on the roof here. With a sigh of relief, Hugh saw the millionaire leave the room. Then he stood, took a running jump, and caught the ridge of the sloping roof on the side nearest the road. He threw his leg over the top of the roof and sat straddleways, leaning against a chimney stack. It was then that an idea came to him, simple and direct. As Peterson came strolling round a corner of the house, followed by several men and a long ladder, Hugh commenced to shout. He roared at the top of his very powerful voice, and he saw Peterson look nervously over his shoulder towards the road. The gorgeous simplicity of his manoeuvre made Hugh burst out laughing. 
Then once again his voice rose to its full pitch as he greeted the sun with a bellow which scared every rook in the neighbourhood. It was just as two labourers came to investigate the hideous din that Peterson's party discovered the ladder was too short by several yards. Then, with great rapidity, the audience grew. A passing milkman, two commercial travellers, a gentleman of slightly inebriated aspect, and finally more farm labourers. And still Hugh sang out, and Peterson cursed. And still the audience grew. Then at last came the police. Hello, old Bean! A cheerful shout from the ground made Hugh look down. There, ranged round Peterson in an effective group, were Peter Durrell, Algy Longworth and Jerry Seymour. What are you up to? Birds nesting? Peter, old soul, cried Hugh. Never thought the day would come when I should be pleased to see your face, but it has. For heaven's sake, get a move on with that blinking ladder. I'm getting cramp. Ted and his pal have toddled off in your car, said Peter, so that only leaves us four and Toby. For a moment, Hugh stared at him blankly while he did some rapid mental arithmetic. Ted and us four and Toby made six, and six was the strength of the party as it had arrived. Adding the pal made seven. So who was the pal? The matter was settled just as he reached the ground. Lackington, wild-eyed and almost incoherent, rushed from the house and, drawing Peterson on one side, spoke rapidly in a whisper. It's all right, muttered Algy. They're halfway to London by now, and going like hell if I know Ted. It was then that Hugh started to laugh. He laughed till tears poured down his face, and Peterson's livid face of fury made him laugh still more. Right under your bally noses, stole away. Give it up, you two old dears, and take to knitting. Go away, said Toby, looking up as the door opened and Hugh strolled in. Your presence is uncalled for and we're not pleased, are we, Miss Benton? Could you bear him lying about the house all day, Phyllis? said Hugh. Toby Sinclair stood up, looking slightly puzzled. What's the notion, old son? I want you to stop here, Toby, said Hugh, and not let Miss Benton out of your sight. Also, keep your eyes skinned on the elms and let me know by phone to Half Moon Street anything that happens. Do you get me? I get you, said Toby. But I say, Hugh... Can I do something a bit more active? Something more active? echoed Hugh. You bet your life, old boy. A rapid one step out of the room. You're far too young for what's coming now. With a resigned sigh, Toby rose and walked to the door. As the door closed, Hugh took her into his arms. Hiram C. Potts was sitting motionless in a chair, staring dazedly in front of him. Hopeless, sir remarked Denny, rising to his feet as Hugh came into the room. He thinks this here meat juice is poison and he won't touch it. All right, Denny, said Drummond. Leave the poor blighter alone. We've got him back and that's something. He turned on his heel abruptly and went back to the sitting room. What luck, said Jerningham. Damn all. You blighters finished the beer? Uh, probably, remarked Peter Durrell. What's the programme now? Two things. First is to get Potts away to a place of safety. The second is to get over to Paris. Jerningham stood up. Well, there's a car outside the door. There's England at our disposal. We'll take him away. You pad the hoof to Victoria and catch the boat train. Have a look out of the window, said Hugh, and you'll see a man frightfully busy doing nothing not far from the door. You will also see a racing car just across the street. Put a wet compress on your head and connect the two. A gloomy silence settled on the assembly, to be broken by Jerry Seymour, suddenly waking up with a start. I've got stomachache, he announced proudly. His listeners gazed at him unmoved. You shouldn't eat so fast, remarked Algy. The stomachache, he repeated. I'll go off to the aerodrome now and get her ready. Bring Potts along in half an hour, and I'll fly him to the Governor's Palace in Norfolk, then I'll take you over to Paris. Great said Hugh, hitting Jerry Seymour on the back. Take him to Ted's place. Lady Jerningham won't mind, will she, old boy? The mater, said Ted. Mind? Good Lord, no. She gave up minding anything years ago. Right, said Hugh. Then off you go, Jerry. As for you, Ted, you're going to do some amateur acting in Paris. So go and raise a complete 
waiter's outfit. Peter, you'll come with me to the aerodrome. Afterwards, look up Mullings at 13 Green Street, Hoxton, and tell him to get in touch with at least 50 demobbed soldiers who are on for a scrap. Ten minutes later, Hugh was at the wheel of his car with Durrell and the millionaire behind. But he seemed in no great hurry to start. A whimsical smile was on his face as, out of the corner of his eye, he watched the man who had been busy doing nothing, feverishly trying to start his car, which, after the manner of the brutes, had seized that moment to jib. "'Get away, man!' cried Peter. "'What are you waiting for?' "'Peter, the refinements of this game are lost on you.' He got out and walked up to the perspiring driver. Ah, "'Warm day,' he murmured. "'Don't hurry.' We'll wait for you. The man, utterly taken aback, stared at him speechlessly. Hugh, you are quite mad, said Peter, as with a spluttering roar the other car started. On the way to the aerodrome, Hugh stopped twice after a block in the traffic to make quite sure that the pursuer should have no chance of losing him. By the time they were spinning towards their destination, the gentleman in the car behind fully agreed with Durrell. His orders were to follow the millionaire and inform headquarters where he was taken to. At the moment it seemed easy money. Then, quite suddenly, the car in front turned through the entrance of a small aerodrome. He pulled up just short of the gates. What was he to do? Leaving his car where it was, he followed the others into the aerodrome on foot. Perhaps someone might be able to tell him where the plane was going. And there she was, with the car beside her, and already the millionaire was being strapped into his seat. Drummond was talking to the pilot, and the sleuth, full of eagerness, accosted a passing mechanic. Peter Durrell chose that moment to look around. He saw the mechanic talking earnestly to the sleuth, whereupon he talked earnestly to Drummond. In thinking it over after, that unhappy man found it difficult to say exactly what happened. All of a sudden, he found himself surrounded by people, all very affable, it took him quite five minutes to get back to his car. Drummond was standing by the gates when he got there. One I've seen often, remarked the soldier. Two sometimes, three rarely, four never. Fancy four punctures all at the same time. Dear, dear, I positively insist on giving you a lift. He felt himself irresistibly propelled towards Drummond's car. After a few minutes, his hand went instinctively to his pocket to find the revolver had gone. The man he had thought mad laughed gently. Didn't know I was once a pickpocket, did you? Handy little gun, too. Is it all right, Peter? All safe, came a voice from behind. Then dot him one. The sleuth had a fleeting vision of stars of all colours which danced before his eyes, coupled with a stunning blow on the back of the head. Vaguely he realised the car was pulling up, then blackness. It was not till four hours later that a passing labourer, having pulled him out from a not over-dry ditch, laid him out to cool. My dear fellow, I told you we'd get here somehow. Hugh Drummond stretched his legs luxuriously. The fact that it was necessary to crash your blinking bus in a stray field in order to avoid their footling passport regulations is absolutely immaterial. A French gendarme was advancing towards them down the stately vestibule of the Ritz, waving protesting hands. He addressed himself in a voluble crescendo to Drummond. Mais, monsieur, vous n'avez pas de passeport. The little man shot up and down like an agitated semaphore. Vous comprenez? C'est défendu d'arriver en Paris sans de passeport. Jerry translated. Uh, it's forbidden to arrive in Paris without passports. Hugh tried to explain. Mais, mon colonel, nous avons craché dans une field uh, des, um, de, des rognons. What the hell are you laughing at, Jerry? Oignon, old boy. Rognons are kidneys. What the dickens does that matter? demanded Hugh. Vive la France! On basse les boches! The gendarme shrugged. Of course, this large Englishman was mad. Why, otherwise, should he spit in the kidneys? Truly an insane race, and yet he had fought in the brigade next to them near Montauban in July 16, and he had liked them, those mad Tommies. 
Moreover, this large, imperturbable man, with a charming smile, showed a proper appreciation of his merits, an appreciation not shared up to the present, regrettable to state, by his own superiors. Colonel Pablo, eh bien, pourquoi non? He produced a notebook. He wants your name, old dear, murmured Jerry. Hugh beamed on the gendarme. My name is Captain Hugh Drummond. As he spoke, a man sitting close by, who had been an amused onlooker of the whole scene, stiffened suddenly and stared hard at Hugh. It was only for a second, but Hugh had seen that quick look. When at last the gendarme departed, he leaned over and spoke to Jerry. See that man with the cigar? He's in this game. I'm just wondering on which side. He was not left long in doubt, for barely had the swing doors closed behind the gendarme when the man in question rose and came over to him. Excuse me, sir, but I heard you say you were Captain Hugh Drummond. I guess you're one of the men I've come across the water to see. My card. Hugh glanced at the pasteboard. Jerome K. Green. A jolly sort of name. Mr. Green suddenly displayed a badge hidden under his coat. That is the badge of the police force of the United States of America, and that same force is humming some at the moment. A prominent citizen of New York City has been mislaid, Captain, and from information we've got, we reckon you know quite a lot about his whereabouts. He tapped Hugh on the knee impressively. I want him. I want Hiram C. Potts like a man wants a drink in a dry state. I want to take him back in cotton wool to his wife and daughters. That's why I'm over this side, Captain, just for that one purpose. Now, have you got him? In a manner of speaking, yes, answered Hugh, beckoning to a passing waiter.、Uh, three martinis. The detective leaned forward eagerly. Where is he? Hugh laughed. <laughs> Being wrapped up in cotton wool by somebody else's wife and daughters, you were a little too quick, Mr. Green. You may be all you say. On the other hand. You may not, and these days I trust no one. The American nodded his head in approval. Quite right, it's my motto, and yet I'm going to trust you. Weeks ago, through certain channels, we heard on the other side about a show which was being planned over here. It was a bit vague, and there were big men in it, but at the time it was no concern of ours. You run your own worries, Captain, over this side. Hugh nodded. Go on," he said. Then Hiram Potts got mixed up in it. Exactly how we weren't wise to, but it was enough to bring me over here. Two days ago, I got this cable. Hugh took the cablegram and glanced at it. It was short and to the point. Captain Hugh Drummond of Half Moon Street, London, is your man. The American drained his cocktail. Captain Hugh Drummond of Half Moon Street, London, is your man," he said. "That's the message I received from the States. Well, Captain, what about it? Will you tell me why you've come to Paris? I guess it's something to do with the business I'm on. Look at the gentleman opposite," said Hugh. "The one hitting his knee with his left hand. That is why I came to Paris." Why is he kind of friendly with Hiram C. Potts? The first time I met Mr. Potts," said Drummond, "that Frenchman had just put a thumbscrew on him. That was when I removed your millionaire. I should put that gentleman down as a sort of super criminal. I wonder what name he is passing under here. Why do they vary? Well, in England, he's clean-shaven, possesses a daughter, and answers to Carl Peterson." Possesses a daughter. For the first time, the detective displayed traces of excitement. Holy smoke! It can't be him. Look, he's going into the restaurant. What is he doing here, dining with Hawking, our cotton trust man? And that's Steinman, isn't it? The German coal man. That other guy's face is familiar. I, I can't quite place his name. Two of them, at any rate, Captain, have got more millions than we're ever likely to have thousands. Hugh stared at the American. 
Last night, he was foregathering with a crowd of the most atrocious revolutionaries it's ever been my luck to run up against. The detective slapped his leg. I'll eat my hat if that Frenchman isn't Franklin or Libstein or Baron de Rot or any other of the blamed names he calls himself. He's the biggest proposition we've ever been up against, and he's done us every time. He always covers his tracks. He's a genius. Gee, if we could only lay him by the heels. Excuse me a moment, said Hugh. Waiter. A man who had been hovering round came up promptly. Four of them, Ted, said Hugh. Frenchman with a beard, a yank, and two boshes. Do your best. Right, I will, Ben, said the waiter, and disappeared unobtrusively into the restaurant. The American was staring at him in amazement. Who the devil is that guy? Ted Jerningham, son of Sir Patrick Jerningham, Bart, of Jerningham Hall, Rutland, England. Incidentally, your friend Mr. Potts is at present tucked between the sheets in that very house. He went there by aeroplane this morning. He waved a hand towards Jerry. He was the pilot. The American was shaking his head a little dazedly. If you and your pals, Captain, are ever out of a job, the New York police is yours for the asking. He thought for a moment. Revolutionaries last night, international financiers this evening. Why, the broad outline of the plan is as plain as the nose on your face. Quite a number of people in this world would benefit if England became a sort of second Russia. It would be worth paying through the nose for such a thing. Of course, it would have to be done properly. A series of small strikes would be useless. It would have to be one gigantic general strike all over your country. And that is what Peterson's playing for. I'll stake my bottom dollar. He's in with the big financiers, and he's using the tub-thumping Bolshies as tools. And where the devil does Potts come in, said Hugh. And the Duchess of Lampshire's pearls. Pearls, began the American, when the restaurant door opened suddenly and Ted Jerningham emerged, followed with miraculous rapidity by a crowd of infuriated head waiters. He advanced, while his entourage, torn between rage at his effrontery and horror at the thought of a scene, followed in his wake. Just opposite Hugh, he halted, and in a clear voice addressed no one in particular. You're spotted. Look out. Ledger at Godalming. Then, engulfed once more in the crowd, he disappeared from view. The Ledger at Godalming, said Hugh. Last night I watched Peterson through the skylight with that volume. I'm thinking, Mr Green, we'll have to look inside that ledger. It was the Comte de Guy who boarded the boat express at the Gare du Nord the next day. It was Carl Peterson who stepped off the boat express at Boulogne. And it was only Drummond's positive assurance which convinced the American that the two characters were the same man. Peterson was leaning over the side of the boat reading a telegram when he first saw Hugh ten minutes after the boat had left the harbour. He waved a cheerful greeting. This is a pleasant surprise, he remarked. Have you been to Paris too? Drummond looked at him. Was the man so sure of his power of disguise that he assumed he hadn't been recognised? And it suddenly struck Hugh that, save for the one habit of striking his knee with his left hand, which in all probability Peterson himself was unconscious of, he would probably not have recognised him. Yes, said Drummond. Came over to see how you behaved yourself. What a pity I didn't know, said Peterson, carefully tearing the telegram into tiny pieces and dropping them overboard. We might have had another of our homely little chats over some supper. Where did you stay? At the Ritz. And you? I always stop at the Bristol, answered Peterson. Quieter than the Ritz, I think. Yes, it was uh, quite dreadful last night, said Hugh. A pal of mine, quite incorrigible. That bird over there, he pointed to Ted Jerningham, insisted on dressing up as a waiter. Not content with that, he went and dropped the fish over some warrior's boiled shirt and had to leave in disgrace. He selected a cigarette. No accounting for this dressing up craze, is there, Carl? You'd never be anything but your own sweet self, would you? He looked thoughtfully at Peterson. I see you've thrown away your cigar, Carl. Can it be... Oh, surely not, that you're feeling icky-boo, face going green, collar tight. 
A few minutes later, Jerningham and the American found him leaning against the rails, still laughing. What's happened? asked Jerningham. It's happening, said Drummond. Peterson has been overcome by the waves. Our little Carl is busy recalling his past. But even in the midst of his agony, Peterson was consoled by one reflection. Should it be necessary, letter awaits him. So had run the telegram which he had scattered to the winds right under Drummond's nose. And it was necessary. Walk right in, Mr. Green, said Hugh, as three hours later they got out of a taxi in Half Moon Street. This is my little rabbit hutch. He followed the American up the stairs and produced his latchkey. But before he could insert it, the door was flung open and Peter Durrell stood facing him with evident relief in his face. Thank the Lord you've come, old son. There's something going down at Godalming. He followed Hugh into the sitting room. At twelve o'clock today, Toby rang up. He was talking away when suddenly he stopped short and said, My God, what do you want? Then there was the sound of a scuffle. I heard Toby curse and then nothing more. I rang and rang, no answer. What do you do? said Drummond, a letter in his hand which he had taken off the mantelpiece. Aldrey was here. He drove straight off to see if he could find out what was wrong. I stopped here to tell you. Hugh said nothing. He was reading the letter. It was short and to the point. When did this come? he said. An hour ago? Denny, he shouted. I want my car round at once. He looked at the two men. If they've hurt one hair of her head, I'll murder that gang one by one with my bare hands. May I see this letter? said the American. He read out. For pity's sake, come at once. The bearer of this is trustworthy. He looked up. It's my fiancé's writing, said Hugh. Are you certain? said the detective. There is such a thing as forgery. A girl in real trouble wouldn't put in that bit about the bearer. I'm going to Godalming, said Hugh. Well, if you go, said the detective, I come too. And me, said Peter. Hugh grinned. Not you, old son. If Mr. Green will come, I'll be delighted, but I want you here at headquarters. They did the trip in well under the hour. Drummond parked and dodged rapidly through the bushes. When the American finally overtook him, he was standing by a side door, knocking hard. Seems kind of empty, said the detective. Why not try the front door? Because it's inside of the other house, said Hugh. I'm going to break in. He retreated a yard from the door, then, bracing his shoulder, he charged it. Rapidly, the two men went from room to room. Every one was empty. Finally, only the dining room remained, and as they stood by the door looking round, the American shifted his third piece of gum to a new point of vantage. Looks like a boozing den after a thick night. Hugh took in the disorder. The tablecloth was pulled off, the telephone lay on the floor, china and glass smashed to pieces littered the carpet. He suddenly stepped forward and picked up a plain circle of glass with a black cord attached to it through a small hole. Algy Longworth's eyeglass, he muttered. So he's been caught too. At that moment, clear and distinct through the still evening air, came a woman's agonised scream from the house next door. The American watched Drummond, running like a stag, cross the lawn and disappear in the trees. For a second he hesitated, then he rapidly left the house by the way they had entered. Drummond had yielded to impulse. Subconsciously he had known that he was deliberately putting his head into what, in all probability, was a carefully prepared noose. But when a girl shrieks, and the man who loves her hears it, arguments begin to look tired. And what little caution might have remained completely vanished as Hugh saw the girl watching him with agonised terror in her face from an upstairs window as he dashed up to the house. I'm coming, darling! He had given one wild shout and hurled himself through the door. A dazzling light had shone in his face, momentarily blinding him. Then had come a crushing blow on the back of his head, and Hugh Drummond, dimly conscious of men all round him, had pitched forward on his face into utter oblivion. It's too easy, said Lackington. So you have thought before, Henry, said Peterson, and he always bobs up again. 
If you take my advice, you'll finish him off here and now and run no further risks. Kill him while he's unconscious. No, Carl, not under any circumstances. He has quite a lengthy score to pay, and by God, he's going to pay it this time. Lash him up like the other two, said Lackington, and leave him to cool until I get back tomorrow. He turned to two of the men standing near. Carry him to the central room. Another of you get the rope. And so it was that Algie Longworth and Toby Sinclair, swathed in rope and with fury in their hearts, watched the limp form of their leader being carried in. They sat and watched the same process being performed on Drummond. Have you finished? said Lackington. The rope artist bestowed a final touch to the last knot and surveyed his handiwork. Cold mutton would be lively compared to him when he wakes up. Good. Then we'll bring him to. Lackington took some crystals from a jar on one of the shelves and placed them in a tumbler. Then he added a few drops of liquid and held the glass directly under the unconscious man's nose. In less than a minute, Drummond opened his eyes and stared dazedly round the room. He blinked as he saw Longworth and Sinclair. Then he looked down and found he was similarly bound. Feeling better, my friend? Lackington laid the tumbler on a table close by and turned to a man standing near the door. My compliments to Miss Benton and ask her to be good enough to come down. She came almost at once, a villainous-looking blackguard with her, and as she saw Hugh, she held out her hand to him. Why did you come? Didn't you know it was only a forgery, that note? If a charming girl is unwilling to write to her fiancé, said Lackington, her father is a very suitable person to supply the deficiency, especially if he has been kindly endowed by nature with a special aptitude for imitating writing. Mr. Benton, who had been standing outside the door, came lurching into the room. Quite wry Lackington, he announced. Dreadful thing to separate two young people. Then he saw Drummond. Was he all tied up for either? His voice tailed off and he collapsed gracefully in a heap on the floor. Phyllis turned on Lackington. It's your doing entirely that he's in that condition. Lackington smiled. When we're married, we'll put him into a really good home for inebriates. Married, she whispered. I'd kill myself before I married you. Lackington glanced at his watch. Time presses, and I don't want to go without telling you a little about the programme, Captain Drummond. Unfortunately, both Mr Peterson and I have to leave you for tonight. Tomorrow, when I return... I propose to try a few experiments on you, and though I fear you will find them painful, it is a great thing to suffer in the cause of science. You will always have the satisfaction of knowing that dear little Phyllis will be well cared for. With a sudden movement, he seized the girl and kissed her before she realised his intention. The rope round Drummond creaked as he struggled impotently. A rain of blows came down on Drummond's face, till, with a gasping sigh, the girl slipped fainting to the floor. "'That'll do, Lackington,' said Peterson. "'Have the girl carried upstairs and send for Heinrich. It's time we were off.' Lackington turned as the German came into the room. "'Now leave them to you, Heinrich. Use the dog whip if they shout and gag them.' They will not shout twice, said the German. Slowly the hours dragged on until the last gleams of daylight had faded from the skylight above and a solitary electric light hung centrally gave the only illumination. At length Heinrich appeared carrying a tray with bread and water on it which he placed on a table near Hugh. With a quiet smile, Hugh looked up at the German... How much, my friend, are you getting for this? The German leered at him. Enough to see that you tomorrow are here. And I always believed that yours was a business nation, said Hugh. 
Why, you poor fool. I've got a thousand pounds in notes in my cigarette case. For a moment, the German stared at him. Then a look of greed came into his pig eyes. You'll have to undo one of the ropes, my friend, before you can get at it, said Hugh. For a moment, the German hesitated. He looked at the ropes. The one that bound the arms in the upper part of the body was separate from the rope round the legs. Even if he did undo it, the fool Englishman was still helpless, and he knew that he was unarmed. What risk was there after all? He went behind the chair, and Hugh felt him fumbling with the rope. You'd better be careful, Heinrich, that none of your comrades see, or you might have to share. The German grunted. The English swine had moments of brightness. He went over and closed the door. Then he resumed untying the rope. At last it fell clear, and the German sprang back. Hugh extracted the case and held it in one hand. Put the case on the table, cried the German. Certainly not, said Hugh. Until you undo my legs, then you shall have it. First eyes and notes must have. The German was creeping nearer and nearer to the back of the chair. Then I your legs undo, and you may go. Algy's warning cry rang out simultaneously with the lightning dart of the Bosch's hand as he snatched at the cigarette case over Drummond's shoulder. It was the move he had been hoping for, and the German's wrist was held fast in his vice-like grip. Slowly, inexorably, the German was pulled over Drummond's shoulder until he grabbed the man's neck with his other hand. The end came quite suddenly. With one dreadful, convulsive heave, the German fell doubled up on the floor and lay still. Within a few minutes, all three were free. Let's get the door open, said Algy, and explore. Cautiously, they swung it open. The hall was deserted. They crept forward. Suddenly, Drummond, who was in front of the other two, stopped with a warning hiss. A light was streaming out from under a door at the end of a passage, and as they stood watching it, they heard a man's voice coming from the same room. Someone else answered him, and then there was silence once more. At length, Hugh moved forward again, and the others followed. It was not until they got quite close to the door that a strange, continuous noise began to be noticeable. It rose and fell with monotonous regularity. Occasionally it was punctuated with a strangled snort. Great Scott, muttered Hugh. The whole boiling are asleep or I'll eat my hat. Then who was it that spoke? said Algy. As if in answer to his question, there came the voice again from inside the room. Well, Mr. Darrell, I guess we can pass on and leave this bunch. With a laugh of joyful amazement, Hugh flung open the door and found himself looking from the range of a yard into two revolvers. I don't know how you've done it, boys, he said, but you can put those guns away. I hate looking at them from that end. He glanced round the room and a grin spread over his face. There were some twenty of the gang, all of them fast asleep. They sprawled grotesquely over the table, they lolled in chairs, they lay on the floor, they huddled in corners and without exception, they snored and snorted. A dandy bunch, remarked the American. Say now, Captain, we got a lorry load of the boys outside. Your friend here thought we'd better bring him along, so it's up to you to get busy. Darrell saw the look of mystification on Hugh's face. Mullings and his crowd, he said. When Mr. Green got back and told me you'd shoved your great mutton head in it again, thought I'd better bring the whole outfit. Though you... Daisy, cried Hugh, rubbing his hands together. The Philistines are delivered into our hands. Get the boys in, Peter, and get these lumps of meat carted out to the lorry. And while you do that, we'll go upstairs and mop up. What's the fifth step? But the murderous implement was not in use, and they passed up the stairs in safety. As they reached the top, a door opposite opened, and the man who had been guarding Phyllis Benton peered out suspiciously. His jaw fell as he saw the four men in front of him. Before he realised it, the American's revolver was within an inch of his head. Keep quite still, son, or I guess it might sort of go off. 
Hugh stepped past him, smiling at the girl who, with a joyful cry, had risen from her chair. Your face, old boy, she whispered as he took her in his arms. Your poor old face. Hugh grinned. It's something to know that anything could damage it, old thing. Personally, I've always thought that any change must be for the better. For a moment, she clung to him. Where's your father? he asked after a little pause. In the dining room, I think. Algy, take Miss Benton and her father up to Half Moon Street at once, then come back here. He drew Longworth aside. You'll have a bit of a job with the old man. Get a couple of the boys to give you a hand. He turned to the cowering ruffian, who was by this time shaking with fright. Now, you ugly-looking blighter, how many of these rooms up here are occupied, and which? It appeared that only one was occupied, and at that moment its door was flung open, and a thin, weedy object clad in a flannel nightgown stood on the threshold. Hugh extended an arm and pulled him into the passage. This is an outrage, he cried. Your legs undoubtedly are, remarked Hugh. Put on some trousers and get a move on. Now, you, he turned to the other man. When does Lackington return? Tomorrow, sir. Where is he now? The man hesitated for a moment, but the look in Hugh's eyes galvanised him into speech. He's after the old woman's pearls, sir, the Duchess of Lampshire's. Of course he is, said Hugh. I forgot. And when does Peterson come back? Tomorrow too, sir, as far as I know, answered the man, and at that the weedy object shot rapidly out of his room. And what's he doing? demanded Drummond. On the level, Governor, I can't tell you. He can. The man pointed to the latest arrival, who, with his nightgown tucked into his trousers, stood gasping painfully after the manner of a recently landed fish. Hugh turned to the American. This is one of the revolutionary brigade I spoke to you about. For a while, the three men studied him in silence. Then the American thoughtfully transferred his chewing gum to a fresh place. It looks like some kind of disease, but I guess he's got a tongue. Say, flop ears, what are you anyway? I am the secretary of a social organization which aims at the amelioration of the conditions under which the workers of the world slave. You don't say, remarked the American, unmoved. What do you know about Peterson, little man? said Hugh. Nothing, save that he is the man we have been looking for for years. A man of stupendous organizing power who has brought together and welded into one the hundreds of societies similar to mine. Now we are combined and our strength is due to him. Hugh exchanged glances with the American. Tell me, little man, now that you're all welded together, what do you propose to do? That you shall see in good time. Constitutional methods have failed. And besides, we've got no time to wait for them. Millions are groaning under the intolerable bonds of the capitalist. Those millions we shall free to a life that is worthy of a man. And it will all be due to our leader, Carl Peterson. At that moment, Darrell's voice came up from the hall. A whole bunch of stowed away, Hugh. What's the next item? Hugh walked to the top of the stairs. As he went down, he cried over his shoulder. Bring them both below. A grin spread over his face as he saw half a dozen familiar faces in the hall and he hailed them cheerily. Like old times, boys, where's the driver of the lorry? That's me, sir. One of the men stepped forward. My mate's outside. Good, said Hugh. Take your bus ten miles from here, then drop that crowd of sleeping beauties one by one on the road as you go along. Then take her back to your garage. I'll see you later. Now, we've got to set the scene for tomorrow morning. He sat down on the foot of the stairs. Gather round and listen to me. For five minutes he spoke, and his audience nodded delightedly. Apart from their love for Drummond, and three out of every four of them knew him personally, it was a scheme which tickled them to death and he was careful to tell them just enough of the sinister design of the master criminal to make them realise the scale of the issue. Hugh pulled the car up silently in the deep shadows of some trees, hard by Laidley Towers, 
and he and Toby Sinclair got out. Now, old boy, said Hugh, you take her back to the elms. But confound it all, said Toby Sinclair. Don't you want me to help you? I do, by taking the buzz box back. This little show is my shout. Grumbling, Sinclair stepped back into the car, and Hugh stood watching as it disappeared. The sudden snap of a twig close by, the sharp hiss of a compressed air rifle, seemed simultaneous with Hugh hurling himself flat on his face behind a sheltering bush. In reality, there was that fraction of a second between the actions which allowed the bullet to pass harmlessly over his body, instead of finishing his career there and then. Very cautiously, he turned his head and peered about. A shrub was shaking a few yards away, and on it Hugh fixed his half-closed eyes. If he lay quite still, the man, whoever he was, would probably assume the shot had taken effect and come and investigate. For two minutes he saw no one. Then very slowly the branches parted and the man came out into the open. It was Peterson's chauffeur. Step by step he advanced towards the motionless figure, his weapon in readiness. But the soldier lay sprawling and inert. Contemptuously he rolled Drummond over. Then he laid his gun on the ground, preparatory to running through his victim's pockets. The fact that such an action was a little more foolish than offering a man-eating tiger a peppermint lozenge did not trouble the chauffeur. In fact, nothing troubled him again. For a while, the soldier stared at the body, frowning thoughtfully. Then, bending over the dead man, he removed his long grey driving coat and cap and threaded his way through the bushes in search of the car. He found it about a hundred yards nearer the house. He put on the driving coat, then turned and crept towards the house. Lately Towers was en fête. The Duchess had spared no pains to make the evening a success. At the moment Hugh came in sight of the house, the Duke, bored to extinction, was engaged in shaking hands with a tall, aristocratic-looking Indian. How'd you do? he murmured. He whispered to the Duchess. What do you say the damn fellow's name was, my dear? We're so glad you could come, Mr. Ramdar, said the Duchess. Everyone is so looking forward to your wonderful entertainment. Round her neck were the historic pearls, and as the Indian bowed low over her outstretched hand... His eyes gleamed for a second. It had been the Marquis of Laidley himself who had suggested getting hold of this most celebrated performer of the occult, who had apparently never been in England before. And since the Marquis of Laidley's coming of age was the cause of the whole evening's entertainment, his suggestion had been hailed. As Hugh Drummond crept closer to the open window, he saw Irma Peterson entering the room with young Laidley. Do you want anything done, Mr. Ramdar? asked the Duchess, the lights down, the window shut. No, I thank you, said the Indian. From a pocket in his robe he took a bag and two small bronze dishes. Placing them on a table, he stood waiting. I am ready, he announced. Who will first learn of the things that are written on this scroll of fate? Sand does not lie. I can but say what is written. It was at that moment that the intent watcher outside the window began to shake with silent mirth. For the face was the face of the Indian Ramdar, but the voice was the voice of Lackington. Suddenly Hugh saw something which made him rub his eyes. Irma, who had an evening wrap thrown loosely over her arm, edged a step or two towards a table containing a small inlaid Chinese cabinet, a beautiful ornament. Then she half dropped her wrap on the table and picked it up again. It was done so rapidly, so naturally, that for a while Hugh thought he had made a mistake. But as she joined the others, he saw that the small cabinet now standing on the table was not the one that had been there previously. Hugh waited with growing impatience for the principal event, but the performer seemed in no hurry. An intimate knowledge of the skeletons in the cupboards of most of those present enabled the gods to speak with disconcerting accuracy. 
At last, Lackington seemed to tire of the amusement. The Indian tipped back his sand into the little bag. As he replaced it in his pocket, his eyes fell on the Chinese cabinet. Where, he demanded, did the protector of the poor obtain the sacred cabinet of Chao Kings? The Duke coughed. Uh, uh, one of my ancestors picked it up somewhere. The Indian's fingers hovered over it. In this box lies the power which renders visible or invisible at will. Do you mean, said the Duke, you can put something into that box and it disappears? For a mortal eye, protector of the poor, though it is still there, and that only for a time, then it reappears. So runs the legend. Well, stuff something in, cried Young lately, and let's see. Sahib, to me that box is sacred beyond words. But Mr. Ramdar, pleaded the Duchess, can't you satisfy our curiosity after all you've said? He bowed, a deep oriental bow. Your Grace... For centuries that box contained the jewels, precious beyond words, of the reigning queens of the Chao dynasty. They were wrapped in silver and gold tissue, of which this is a feeble modern substitute. From a cummerbund under his rope, he drew a piece of shining material. Supposing you took my pearls, Mr. Ramdar, said the Duchess. The Indian seemed sunk in thought, while the rest of the party added their entreaties. At length, the Duchess undid the fastening and held the necklace out. I will try, he announced. The Duchess headed the chorus of delight. Your Grace, will you take that? He handed her the piece of material. No hand but yours must touch the pearls. Wrap them up inside the silver and gold. Now, advance alone and open the box. Place the pearls inside. Now shut and lock it. The Duchess complied. The Indian knelt on the floor and poured some powder into a little brazier. A greenish, spluttering flame rose, and a heavy, odorous smoke began filling the room. The Indian began to chant. After a while, he grew frenzied and beat his head with his hands. Place the box upon the floor, he ordered, in the light of the sacred fire. The Duchess knelt and placed the box on the floor. Open the box! With fingers that trembled a little, the Duchess turned the key and threw back the lid. <gasps> Why, it's empty, she cried, and the guests craned forward to look. Put not your hand inside, cried the Indian, or perchance it will remain empty. The Duchess rapidly withdrew her hand and stared through the smoke at his impassive face. Shut the box, your grace, and lock it as before. Now place it on the table whence it came. Again the harsh chant began, growing increasingly frenzied. More and more powder was thrown on the brazier, till dense clouds of vapour were rolling through the room. Bring the box, your grace, cried the Indian, and once more the Duchess knelt in the circle of light. Open, but as you value your pearls, touch them not. Excitedly, she threw back the lid, and a chorus of cries greeted the appearance of the gold and silver tissue at the bottom of the box. They're here, Mr. Ramdar. In the name of the power in this box, I warn you, do not touch those pearls till the light has burned low in the brazier. If you do, they will disappear, never to return. Watch, but do not touch. As he backed slowly towards the window, Hugh dodged rapidly towards the car. He was only a second or two in front of Lackington, but as they drove rapidly away, Lackington was far too busy to bother with the chauffeur. The transformation to the normal kept him busy, and as Hugh drove, he could see Lackington's reflection removing the makeup from his face and changing his clothes. 
As the car swung into the drive at the Elms, Lackington said, Change the wheels as usual, then report to me in the central room. Out of the corner of his eye, Hugh watched him enter the house with one of the Chinese cabinets clasped in his hand. Hugh found Toby in the garage eating a ham sandwich. You know, Toby, he said, I feel sort of sorry for our Henry. He's fooled the complete ducal outfit. He's come back here with a box containing the Duchess's pearls. And now, instead of enjoying life, he's got to have a little chat with me. Come on, let's go on the roof. Silently, they climbed the ladder which had been placed in readiness to find Peter Durrell and the American detective already in position. A brilliant light streamed out through the glass dome and the inside of the central room was clearly visible. In the three chairs sat motionless, bound figures, so swathed in rope that only the tops of their heads were visible. Lackington was seated at the table with a Chinese cabinet in front of him. He seemed to be doing something inside with a penknife. With a quick turn of his wrist, he prized open two flaps of wood and lifted out a parcel of gold and silver tissue. Clever, said Hugh. A false bottom actuated by closing the lid and a similar parcel in the other cabinet. Now Lackington was pressing some small stubs in a niche in one of the walls, and a heavy door was swinging slowly open. It was the mysterious cupboard of which Phyllis had spoken, but nothing had prepared Hugh for the reality. It seemed literally crammed to overflowing with the most priceless loot, shining and scintillating in the light till the glitter almost blinded the watchers. The pearls were carefully placed in a position of honour, and for a few moments Lackington stood, gloating over his collection. Do you see them, Captain Drummond? he said. Each thing obtained by my brain, my hands, all mine, mine. He pressed the studs. The door swung slowly to and closed without a sound. And now, he said, we will prepare your bath, Captain Drummond. He walked over to the shelves where the bottles were ranged. For a few minutes he bent over the chemicals and then he poured the mixture into the water which half filled the long bath at the end of the room. A faintly acid smell rose to the four men above and the liquid turned a pale green. I will deal with you first. Then it will be your friend's turn. He slashed at the ropes behind the chair. With a dull, heavy thud, the body of the dead German, Heinrich, rolled off the chair and sprawled at his feet. He sprang back. My God! he screamed. What has happened? He rushed to the door, only to recoil into the room. Outside stood four masked men, each with a revolver pointing at his heart. My cue, muttered Hugh. He disappeared down the ladder and the three remaining watchers stared at the grim scene. For Lackington had shut the door and was crouching by the table, his nerve utterly gone. Slowly, the door into the hall opened, and with a scream of fear, Lackington sprang back. Standing in the doorway was Hugh Drummond, and his face was grim. He crossed the room and stood in front of the cowering man. Take half! screamed Lackington. I've got treasure! I've... Drummond hit him a fearful blow on the mouth. I shall take it all, Henry, to return to their rightful owners. He called out. Boys, carry out these other two and undo them. The four masked men came in and carried out the two chairs. To your gang, he remarked as the door closed. So now we may regard ourselves as being alone, and one of us, Lackington is going into that bath. But the bath means death, shrieked Lackington. Death in agony. That will be unfortunate for the one who goes in, said Drummond. Now, fight, you worm, or I'll throw you in. And Lackington fought. But strong and wiry though he was, he was no match for the other. Relentlessly he felt himself being forced towards the deadly liquid he had prepared for Drummond. Pushed farther and farther over the liquid, he was only held from falling into it by Drummond's grip on his throat. 
Just before the grip relaxed and he went under, the soldier spoke once. Henry Lackington, the retribution is just. Then Drummond sprang back and the liquid closed over the wretched man's head. It was during the next hour or two that the full value of Mr. Jerome K. Green as an acquisition to the party became apparent. Preparations in honour of Peterson's arrival were duly carried out, and then arose the question of the safe in which the all-important ledger was kept. Drummond pointed to a heavy steel door flush with the wall. You're not going to open that one by pressing any buttons. Then, Captain, said the American, I guess we'll open it otherwise. From his pocket he produced some ordinary soap. I give you a little demonstration of how our cracksmen over the water open safes. He proceeded to seal up every crack in the safe door with the soap, leaving a small gap at the top unsealed. Then round that gap he built what was to all intents and purposes a soap dam. From another pocket he produced a rubber bottle. Might I ask what that is? murmured Hugh politely. The detective carefully poured some of the liquid into the soap dam. This is gel ignite, or as the boys call it, the oil. It runs right round the cracks of the door inside the soap. He carefully replaced the stopper. Now a detonator and a bit of fuse, and I guess we'll all leave the room. From the garden they heard the sound of a dull explosion. When they returned, the American pulled the safe door open. There's your book, Captain. And he calmly relit his cigar, as if safe opening was the most normal undertaking. Drummond lifted out the heavy ledger and placed it on the table. Go out in relays, boys, he said to the group of men by the door, and get your breakfasts. I'm going to be busy for a bit. He sat down at the table, and the detective joined him. As the immensity of the project dawned on the two men, their faces grew serious. One can only hope to heaven that we're in time, said Hugh. In silence they continued their study of the book. The whole of England and Scotland had been split up into districts, each in the charge of a director. Sub-districts each had their sub-director and staff, and at some of the names Drummond rubbed his eyes in amazement. The duties of every man were outlined. Then in each district there appeared ten or a dozen names of people described as lecturers, while at the end of the book there were nearly fifty names of men and women who were denoted as first-class general lecturers. These people's names are absolute household words, said Drummond. They may be swine, they probably are, but they ain't criminals. No more is Peterson, grinned the American. In any country you got all sorts of people with more wind than brain. Some of them believe what they say, some of them don't. They all think they're fooling one another. But what's really going on at the moment is that Peterson is fooling the whole blame lot. Whatever they may think, they're really working for him. Working towards a revolution in this country, said Drummond. Sure thing, said the American. Though when they've talked the boys into bloody murder and your existing social system is down and out, they think they'll be the leaders in the new one. That's what they're playing for, power. And if they get it, God help the men who gave it to them. As for Peterson, if he brings it off, you won't catch him for dust. He'll pocket the boodle and be off. But it ain't criminal. In a court of law, he could swear it was an organization for selling birdseed. It was at that moment that the telephone rang. Hugh picked up the receiver. Very well. I will tell him. He replaced the receiver and turned to the American. Mr. Ditchling will be here for the meeting at two, and Peterson will be late. Who's Ditchling when he's at home? One of the so-called leaders, said Hugh. He turned the pages of the ledger. Ditchling, Charles, good speaker, clever, unscrupulous, requires big money, worth it, drinks. It was a couple of hours later that Hugh rang up his rooms in Half Moon Street. From Algie, who spoke to him, he gathered that Phyllis and her father were quite safe and that Ted Jerningham had just arrived with the hapless Potts, now somewhat recovered. Tell Ted to bring him down to the Elms at once, ordered Hugh. He put down the receiver. 
Potts is coming, Mr Green, and he's talking sense. When Mr Potts arrived, Hugh introduced him to the American detective. This is Mr Green, who has come over from New York especially to find you and take you back to your family. Do you think you can remember enough to tell us what happened at the beginning? The millionaire passed his hand over his forehead. I was stopping at the Carlton with Granger, my secretary. I sent him over to Belfast on a shipping deal and... He paused and looked round the group. Where is Granger? Mr Granger was murdered in Belfast, said Drummond. They wanted you alone. Private secretaries ask awkward questions. After a while, the millionaire recovered his composure and the story continued. Wackington. That was the name of the man I met at the Carlton. And then there was another. Peterson. We dined together. Afterwards, Peterson put up his proposition, a suggestion he thought would appeal to me as a businessman. He said that he could produce a general strike in England. Revolution, in fact. As the biggest ship owner outside this country, I should be able to capture a lot of the British carrying trade. He wanted... Two hundred and fifty thousand pounds to do it, paid one month after the result was obtained. He said there were others in it, and that the others wouldn't come in unless I did. Go on, said Drummond. I told him that he was an infernal scoundrel, and that I'd have nothing to do whatever with such a villainous scheme. And then they both sprang on me, and I felt something prick my arm. After that, I can't remember anything clearly. Hugh glanced at his watch. Time you all retired, boys. The party ought to be starting soon. Drift in again with the lads the instant I ring the bell. Left alone, Hugh sat down and waited. Eventually the door opened and a man came in. Hugh recognised him at once as Valence Nestor, an author of great brilliance who had lately devoted himself to the advancement of revolutionary labour. Good afternoon, murmured Drummond. Mr Peterson will be a little late. I am his private secretary. The other nodded and sat down. Hugh turned the pages of the ledger on the table. What's that? said Valence Nestor. Ah, oh, this is the book where Mr Peterson records his opinions of his fellow workers. Most interesting. Am I in it? Of course, said Drummond. Here you are. He pointed and then drew back in dismay. <laughs> dear, dear, there must be some mistake. But Valence Nestor was staring at this choice description of himself. Nestor. Valence, author, so-called. Hot air factory, but useful up to a point. Inordinately conceited and a monumental ass, not fit to be trusted far. Meanwhile, Hugh, his shoulders shaking slightly, was welcoming the next arrival, a rugged, beetle-browed man, whose face seemed vaguely familiar. Crofter! shouted the infuriated author. Look at this as a description of me! and Hugh watched the man, whom he now knew to be one of the extremist members of Parliament, walk over and glance at the book. He saw him conceal a smile. We'll see, said Valence, what he says about you. Rapidly he turned the pages, and Hugh glanced over Crofter's shoulder at the dossier. He just had time to read. Crofter, John, a consummate blackguard, playing entirely for his own hand, needs careful watching. When the subject of the remarks, his face convulsed with fury, spun round and faced him. Who are all that? Must have been Mr Peterson, said Hugh. I see you had five thousand out of him, so perhaps he considers himself privileged. He turned away to greet Mr Ditchling, who arrived somewhat opportunely in company with a thin, pale man whose identity completely defeated Drummond. Crofter was livid. We'll see what this insolent devil has to say about you, Ditchling. Drinks! Ditchling thumped the table with a heavy fist. What the hell does he mean? What's the meaning of this? They represent Mr Peterson's considered opinions of you all, said Hugh. Perhaps this other gentleman... He turned to the pale youth. Already Nestor had turned up his name. Terence Victor, a wonderful speaker, appears really to believe that what he says will benefit the working man. Consequently, very valuable, but indubitably mad. But I don't understand, said Victor Terence. Does Mr Peterson not believe in our teachings too? As he spoke, the door opened, and Carl Peterson came in. 
Good afternoon, gentlemen, he began, and then he saw Hugh. For the first time since Hugh had known him, his face blanched. Then his eyes fell on the open ledger, and with a dreadful curse he sprang forward. A glance at the faces of the men who stood watching told him what he wanted to know, and with another oath his hand went to his pocket. Take your hand out, Carl Peterson. Drummond's voice rang through the room, and the arch-criminal found himself staring into the muzzle of a revolver. Now, sit down at the table, all of you. The meeting is about to commence. Drummond rang the bell, and twenty masked men ranged themselves in single rank behind their chairs. I shall not detain you long, gentlemen, began Hugh. Before I hand you over to the care of the sportsman who stands so patiently behind you, there are one or two remarks I wish to make. Let me say at once that on the subject of capital and labour, I am supremely ignorant. There are many things we know which are wrong in this jolly old country of ours, but I am sufficiently optimistic to believe that they could be put right. That, however, would not suit your book. Every single one of you, with the sole possible exception of you, Mr Terence, is playing with revolution for his own ends, to make money out of it, to gain power. As for Peterson, your leader, he demanded one million pounds sterling from the four businessmen who financed him, one million pounds as the price of a nation's lifeblood. But not by revolutions will you make this island of ours right. Evolution is our only chance, though that would not suit the book of scum like you. He grinned. I'm getting hoarse. I'm now going to hand you four over to the boys. There's an admirable but somewhat muddy pond outside, and I'm sure you'd like to look for newts. If any of you want to summon me for assault and battery, my name is Drummond. Captain Drummond of Half Moon Street. But I warn you that that book will be handed into Scotland Yard tonight. Out with them, boys, and give them hell. As the door closed behind the last of the struggling prophets of a new world, Drummond said, And now, Carl Peterson, it's time that you and I settled our little account, isn't it? The master criminal rose and stood facing him. Apparently he had completely recovered himself. The hand with which he lit his cigar was as steady as a rock. I congratulate you, Captain Drummond. The sudden opening of the door made both men look round. Drummond bowed to conceal a smile. Just in time, Miss Irma, for settling day. The girl swept past him and confronted Peterson. What has happened? A slight setback has occurred, my dear. I have made a big mistake, a mistake which has proved fatal. I have underestimated the ability of Captain Drummond. Where's Henry? she demanded. That is a point on which I am profoundly ignorant. Perhaps Captain Drummond can enlighten us. Henry's had an accident, said Drummond. But where is he? said the girl. Hugh pressed the studs in the niche of the wall, and the door of the big safe swung open slowly. With a scream of terror, the girl sank half-fainting on the floor, and even Peterson's cigar dropped from his lips. For, hung from the ceiling, was the dead body of Henry Lackington. He inadvertently fell in the bath. He got ready for me, said Hugh. Shut the door, screamed the girl. I can't stand it. She covered her face with her hands, shuddering, while the door slowly swung to again. With the big ledger under his arm, Hugh crossed the room and called to some men in the hall. As the detectives, thoughtfully supplied by Mr Green, entered the central room, Hugh glanced for the last time at Carl Peterson and his daughter. Never had the cigar glowed more evenly between the master criminal's lips. Never had the girl Irma selected a cigarette from her gold and tortoiseshell case with more supreme indifference. Goodbye, my ugly one, she cried with a charming smile as two of the men stepped up to her. 
not goodbye, Irma. Carl Peterson removed his cigar and stared at Drummond steadily. Only au revoir, my friend. Only au revoir.